Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Everybody should be hearing me. And I do have it recording, so. Last ICT Twitter space of 2022. I'm sure it's probably gonna be a, a boring one. <laughs> so, I kinda like wanna just do a brief review of the year and uh, kind of go through a bullet point checklist of things. I promise I won't take too long with it. But uh, last year, I mentioned that I was going to no longer do paid memberships and mentorships and bringing people into a private community and I would move to a public forum and I would be teaching on YouTube and I would return back to Twitter. I have done those things. And I also went one step further to quell the uh, the pursuits of people simply blindly taking my premium content, core lessons and videos and selling them to other people for a personal profit. Uh, I put them up on my YouTube channel. So all of the core content one through 12 that is on my YouTube. You're welcome to go through that and study it at your own pace and leisure. And also mentioned that I would go on, I was going to go out and teach a model that was, in my opinion, very simple. Uh, agreed that if you're a complete neophyte and you don't know what you're doing at all, even the 2022 model that's on my YouTube channel can be a little intimidating. But for those that have plundered through and uh, made their way through copious amounts of videos and lectures and boring dronings by good old ICT, that one struck pay dirt, didn't it? It was something that made a whole lot of sense. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. And you also saw me use it in live streams. You saw me do it in live trades. You saw me do it in demo trades. You saw me outline it beforehand. You saw me outline it in commentary. You heard me talk about it setting up in Twitter spaces. Okay, so it's undeniable. You also saw many people all around the world step forward and place themselves behind the screens and do the work. And they have been funded. They have made money, they've withdrawn profits, they've made their way to the heights of the leaderboards of some of these funded account challenges, okay? And uh, that's undeniable proof. It's a transferable skill set. It's not something that's limited to me. So that should be inspiring to you. Uh, I've also stated that I was going to make it more accessible for you going into 2023, okay? And 2023 is kind of like my victory lap, okay? The the last year for me to be, you know, pouring myself out. As a younger man, I had a lot of energy and I had a lot of, um, well, fire, let's put it that way. And there's changes occurring in my body that I can feel that I've been feeling for the last five years. And they're just, it's slowing me down and I, and I can't deny it. I mean, I tried to pretend it wasn't like that, but it, it certainly is. And no, I'm not sick. It's just, I've had a lot of car accidents and, you know, working out, hurting myself, motorcycle accident. It's all kinds of things that have compounded over the years. And I just want to start taking a little bit easier on myself and my family more or less wants to see me a little bit. <laughs> and uh, my wife wants me in, in her entirety. Like I, I want to provide myself to her more often than not I have. So we made an arrangement that, you know, the 2023 would be my last year doing all this stuff. And it doesn't mean I won't make videos going forward beyond that. But like I mentioned in the last stream, it's probably not going to be anywhere near the pace that you're used to. And that's actually a good thing because you want to see that you have grown to a point of independence, not needing 
me to hold your hand. And that's kind of like the goal. That's my only goal for 2023. Uh, I want to make zero excuses for anyone that has put the work in, studied, back tested, forward tested, tape reading, the whole business. And there'll be no excuse because if you follow me when I do the mentoring in 2023, which will all be Twitter based and YouTube based. Okay. So there won't be any kind of private membership signing into this and that. You don't need that. Okay. So when you see people saying, hey, you know, join ICT's private this, that's a lie because that's not happening. Everything's public. Okay. All my examples are public. I do that for a particular reason. That way, everybody sees the examples. All the examples are the same. There's no, this crowd gets a buy version. This crowd gets the sell version. I've canceled all that stuff for years. There's people out there that say that stuff all the time because they can't do what we do. They got to make up excuses why there's no way humanly possible someone can be as precise as the examples I show. And that's not me beating my chest. Okay. That's just facts. Okay. And unless I make them public like that and everybody sees the same thing, it leaves room for people to make those arguments. And years down the road, when they see things taken out of context, they take pieces of social media and they string along a narrative that is nowhere near to what actually happened. You know, new people, clueless individuals, you know, neophytes or new subscribers or viewers would see that and think, well, you know, there's probably something to that. Maybe there's a reason for caution. And then good old ICT comes out there like I did on a Friday and rip everybody out of their chairs and say, look, this is what really goes on. And we're going to cover a little bit about that today. And I know some of you are dying to know, how did I do back to back two days leaving the fair value gap open and telling you in advance before it happened, you're going to get that. But it's the towards the latter part of the, the space here. Trust me, I got a little itinerary. Okay, so I, I won't forget, I promise. But in 2022, you know, I showed, you know, there's talking heads out there that show you screenshots of a supposed back, you know, background of, you know, their results of, you know, five years ago. <laughs> this is what I did five years ago with a screenshot. And uh, that's, that's supposed to be a, a history, a track, a track history. And I don't delete anything I'm putting out. And when I make a mistake, I leave a typo and I'll say, okay, this is what it is. Or one of my students will come behind me and type in what I meant. And everybody pretty much knows what it is, but I don't delete anything. And any analysis that if I said something, if it's wrong, you see it. And if it's right, it's plain as day. And I went out there and I showed through the lens of a TD Ameritrade account, which is, I I believe it's a commonly accepted, realistic, uh, verified, there's no way to game it. Um, none of the funny business that MT4, and I believe MT5 still can be messed around with. Uh, anything MetaTrader, you know, I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack for this, but you know, that's the reason why I walked away from it. Because once it was revealed, that, and I kind of suspected that a lot of these guys that were doing it, um, saying that you know they made this much money and they only show you the, the history. You, you know what I'm talking about. They show you the little, this is the results of my trace. Here's my week, bro. Here's what I've done. This is, nobody can keep up with me, that type of stuff. But you don't see them actually getting in a trade, managing, placing a stop. And that's what I have always done. When I was on Baby Pips, I showed examples of that. And they were always after the fact, yes. Because you're learning things from, from hindsight, just like a book. Whenever you sit down and you go to college, you know, you're, unless you're doing a lab or having a laboratory uh, event, which is basically what 2023 is going to be, you're going to be in the laboratory with me, Monsters Incorporated. Okay, I'm going to build monsters. All you have to do is put down all your preconceived ideas and opinions about what it is you think you know about me or what it is I do. And I promise you, I guarantee you, you are going to have the proof that you've always looked for. You're going to have the track record. You're going to have the history. You're going to have the results. And you're going to see the fucking money. Okay? All you have to do is come along for the ride. Free. 
I don't have to pay. You don't have to pay for nothing. You ain't got to buy nothing from me. There's no upsell. There's no service down the road. I'm now going to do another mentorship. All you have to do is take a ride with me. That's it. 2023, I'm putting the nail in the coffin. It's done. Anybody that's ever had an opinion about me that's off base or off centered, they're going to get corrected this year. If you had doubts about whether or not you can do this, I'm going to remove that for you. All you have to do is listen. Just show up, take notes, and pay attention. That's all. Don't ask me questions about something else that I'm not talking about at the time. You may think it's a pressing matter for you to learn what you think you're needing to learn. Like right now, the hot button is, I need to know. And every guru out there that's been ripping me off and renaming my stuff, they're all waiting today for me to talk about how I know when fair value gaps stay open. Because that's what separates me from Chris Laurie's group. Okay. And I've always said this. And I'm not shitting on Chris Laurie. I'm just calling it what it is. Because there's a lot of people that say, I learned how to trade from Chris Laurie. Chris Laurie did not teach me how to trade. Period. Okay. That's the end of the story there. I have always stated that if someone wants to go and learn from somebody else, I have never, ever, ever repped anybody else as an educator but that guy. Now, are you going to see him going in there and executing trades? Probably, unless he's changed, I didn't see him doing that. I, I didn't see that. But you also didn't see him teaching what I'm teaching. Okay. So, this whole idea of a liquidity void, okay, that is all, it was always a sticking point for me because I didn't see it that way. But just to be, well, polite, I, I never wanted to correct him, even in our private conversations and, and emails and such. I, I always like tried to ask him what he meant about this or not. And one of the questions I kept asking him all the time is when you refer to a fractal in price, what is it that you mean by that? Like, what are you referring to specifically? Not that I don't know what a fractal is. I wanted to know what it is that he's specifically talking. And I never was able to nail him down to a clear cut response. This is what I refer to here as a fractal. So in a lot of ways, I can see how you know, anybody that's an educator can fall short and miss the mark. And I'm, I've been doing it a lot longer, I believe, than Chris Laurie. And I know a little bit about the market. I know a little bit of how technical analysis works. And I still couldn't glean what it is that he was trying to deliver when he would refer to a fractal. Okay. Maybe someone else, maybe you're in the audience here and then you're a student of his, and maybe he's even listening too. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to either one, but I I just simply couldn't get it from him what he meant. And maybe you did, and that's great. That's that's wonderful. That's why some students of mine, they really resonate with me and that's great. But there's other people that's gonna come here with a sincere desire to learn. And they may even put the work in, but maybe my personality or the way I talk and maybe sometimes I drop F-bombs too much or whatever. Maybe it sounds like I'm bragging when I'm just talking the facts because I coded this, I authored it, it's mine. And I'm proving it. No one else can prove it like this. It's it's not meant to be a divisive thing, but unfortunately, sometimes the truth is very decisive. It's decisive and divisive. Okay, so I, I used to get affected by that. It, I would wear my heart on my sleeve, and on baby pips, I would be offended if someone would say, you know, you know, I don't like how you teach, and it would bother me. Like it would really bother me. Like it, it, it would do damage to me. Where I felt like I said, okay, I got to fix this one person. And I would go overboard and put more and more and more into the videos and more into the instructions. And sometimes I slightly deviated from the, the whole process and plan I outlined that one evening sitting in my living room where I was reading all these people with this nonsense. They would put up and say, this is what makes the market go up. Or this is what makes the market go down. And they would show you these things. They would add on top of their, their charts. Okay. And it was just. It, it angered me because that's a lie. That's a lie. See, even if you're in the audience right now and you don't like Inner Circle Trader, you don't like you don't like Michael Huddleston, you don't like ICT. Okay, you think he's a dick. You think he's a braggadocious, arrogant prick that you know doesn't deserve the attention he gets. Okay, put that aside just for a moment. Okay. 
take your ass over to Twitter and pull up what I did yesterday. Okay. You don't see any of these people out here. None of them. Not one of them. Not a Larry Williams. Not a Oliver Velez, which I actually, I got a story about him a little bit. None of these guys. Nobody has ever done that. Took you from a daily chart all the way down to a five-minute chart. Gave you the very specific levels that the algorithm is going to work with for that particular day. And then I left you with 3864. Note that. When I left you, that was the morning session. So what's the next time you're going to trade the PM session? Mm -hmm. Don't worry. We'll get back to those charts on Friday. But just go back and go through that thread. Once you're done listening to this space today, if you didn't see it, go back and look at it and choke on it. Okay, because there's undeniable proof that there's an algorithm. It's undeniable proof that I'm privy to it. And I got my fingerprints all over it, and you can't do anything to change it. And guess what? Yes, I can stand in a court and do that. Yes, I can demonstrate it, and yes, I can bring receipts. And I want to take you all along for a ride in 2023. I want to take you on an experience that you would have never had, ever. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interactive. It's not going to be inundating. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of videos to, 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 to bog you down. It's going to be very specific. It's going to be right now, in the market, right now, in the charts, before it happens, you're going to fucking see it. You're going to know what's going to happen before it happens. And after a couple months goes by in the middle of the year, you might think to yourself, wow, I have been complicating this the whole time. He's taught this. But I have brought things to this learning process and slowed myself down. Yes, every one of my profitable students comes to that re realization. Always, they tried to bring everything to the table when they try to find a setup. You don't need that. Look at the 2022 model. I clearly reduced that down to the, the minimalist approach to doing it. And it's beautiful. It's poetic in price action. It's not going to work every single time on every single time frame every single minute of the day you have to wait for certain characteristics and signatures to materialize in price and once that occurs and you, i know what some of you are thinking well, what are they ict go through the lessons in that 2022 mentorship it's there you're asking for something else because you're looking for that void in your experience doing it seeing charts print real time studying back data, hindsight movement. So you're trying to fill in a simple response from me that will never adequately fill in the necessity for you as the student and trader in development to go into the charts yourself. See, that's the part that all of the lazy people, every single one of my intakes, 2017, I'm sorry, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 21, Every single group that came into my private mentorship had a group of lazy ass people. And yes, that sounds disrespectful, but folks, that's what it is. That's the defining thing. Oh, I looked at your videos. I watched your videos and I wrote five pages of notes. How are you going to call me lazy? You didn't do the work. What's the work? You got to put your ass in front of the charts. You have to study what it's done. Look for the things that I've taught you. Have copious amounts of notes going back for months. And then you do that each day too, annotating every single time. And you study them on the weekend when the markets aren't trading. You have to pour yourself into this, folks. It's not going to be easy for you. It ain't going to be just watching a video. And some of you, unfortunately, have this expectation that I'm going to somehow make it so easy that you're going to watch a couple live streams with me and you're going to figure it out right then and there. I'm telling you, some of you young men are going to do this and you're making a mistake. You need to spend the entirety of 2023 with me. You have no idea what you're stepping into. You have no idea what you're getting ready to get involved in and learn and what's going to be expected of you personally. You come, you come to me wanting to learn and I'm prepared to teach all of you, but you have to be really prepared to learn. Some of my students that have come to me over the years weren't ready. They had to come, figure it out that it wasn't something they wanted to do or be a part of, and they would leave. 
and go do other things and hurt themselves and come back and say, you know what, I, I didn't feel that that person understood what they were doing. But let me give this ICT one more chance. And I had people do that. I had one guy come in 2016, quit after the first month, then came in on the 2017 group, went halfway through and quit, and then came back in in 2019. And I had made him pay every single month all over again. That was the terms. That was the way it was. You know what? He's happy he did it now. Doesn't need any hand-holding from me. So what does that tell you? He was the problem. You are always going to be the problem. It's not the teacher. It's the person trying to learn this because this is something entirely different from anything else. It's not a sport. It's not an exercise regime where, you know, everybody is going to follow the you know, same procedure. You know, it's not like Peloton. You know, we're not going to be sitting our asses in front of a, a, a computer screen each, each time we do it. And we're all going to have the same results. We're all going to have different results. Even if I were to sit in front of you and press the button and go into the market and trade, Go long. Here's my stop. Here's my target. I'm going to take my partials here. You're all going to do it differently. You're going to sit and wait. Let me see if it really is starting to move in the favor he's talking about. Okay, now I'll chase. I trust it now. He's probably right. You're smiling. You're thinking, damn, he's got me. You know, that's exactly what I would do. Right. This isn't my first rodeo. I've done this for a long, long time, folks. I've trained a lot of people, and I have a lot of students that came and failed. Failed. Not because this stuff doesn't work, because they are broken. They have never fixed themselves. They've never been responsible, personally responsible. And it's so easy for them to point and find a fault outside of themselves. And you're going to have to do very, very hard things in 2023 to keep yourself from feeling that way. Because you're going to do something wrong. You're going to get things incorrect when you're trying to learn. Your observations when I prompt you, what do you think it's going to do right here? Do you think it's going to go to this level or do you think it's going to go to this level? It's interactive. It will be interactive. And if you get it wrong, do not look at that as I'm, I'm defeated. I'm never going to learn this. The moments you don't do it right or if you get it wrong, that's zeroing in on an opportunity for you to improve on. And when I periodically ask everyone as a community, where do you see yourself having a sticking point? It will help me as the educator dial in on the areas collectively where people are having an issue. But if you don't show up every single day, you won't be caught up with the group. That's It's as simple as that. You have to show up. Time will do all the heavy lifting. I know exactly what I'm going to do with y'all. I know exactly what's going to happen. But you have to do the work. You have to show up. You have to stop looking outside of the markets that I'm talking about because I'm not, I don't give a shit about Bitcoin and crypto. Stop asking me. They're going to zero. I've already told you that. Don't ask me about Forex unless I'm talking about it in my analysis. It's done. I'm going to talk about it on a daily chart. That's it. You'll have my view. You'll have my bias. You can work with that. Okay. I'm making that available Monday through Friday, unless my personal schedule or a holiday comes up, I will have a short little concise video talking about where I think the market's likely to go. Is that not enough? It should be. I've already taught you how to trade. I've already taught you a model. If I'm telling you the bias where I think it's going to go, there it is. Sit your ass in front of the charts and study and, and practice with that. You will get the results you're looking for, but they can't be given to you. You must earn them independently. Period. End of story. There's no shortcuts. I wish there was. Because I could have been done the first year doing this on Baby Pips. So here, there it is. It's done. And just see you. <laughs> Check in and see what's going on once in a while. But it's not that it's not that easy, folks. It's hard because each one of us has mental baggage. You have stuff that's wrong with you, but you don't want to call it something wrong. You want to find the reasons to justify your shortcomings your issues, your character flaws. And see, profitable, consistent, long-term successfully trading in the marketplace requires you to master yourself. You're never mastering the markets. It's never going to happen. It's, that is never going to happen. 
How do I know that? Well, I know it like the back of my hand, and I still can be humbled. It'll do something that I didn't I didn't expect. And you saw two examples of that with CPI, which is exactly why I don't trade ahead of it. I know my limitations. I know where I shouldn't step or the market will remove my head cleanly, efficiently. So when I talk about those things and how to avoid it, those unfortunately are the topics and lessons that nobody really wants to pay attention to because they think if they just learn how to pick the right order block or the fair value gap that stays open now, you see how that changes? That's always been a, an interesting study for me as a teacher. Whenever I reveal something, and this is the only thing that my trolls have correct. Everything else, they're full of shit. But every, every single time I've either revealed something new or deeper, everybody collectively that is not really versed in what it is they should be doing or have settled in on a particular model of their own, they clamor to that thing. When it was order blocks, it was it was that. Oh, and it was, and it was breakers and mitigation blocks. And then everybody calls everything mitigation. Mitigate. You know, when I when the market goes up here, it, it mitigates. It drives me nuts. You're you're that's you don't even know what you're talking about. Like, that's nonsense. <laughs> it's nonsense. The market's not mitigating. Okay, the trader that's offside mitigates. Okay, so. You can tell who has learned from who to knock off courses. Like when they say, oh, you know, I'm looking for a liquidity grab. What the hell is that? Like an institutional candle. They don't exist either. So you're going to have to slowly press into uncomfortable places in your learning next year. Because the trolls were right and are right when they say, Every time ICT releases something, a little buzzword or something like that, everybody flocks to it like it's the only thing that works in the marketplace. And they're right. Some of you, a lot of you, do that. And you don't need to do that. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see your passion and pursuit to learn more about it. But I'm not stupid. Like, I know that everybody's going to chase the new buzz thing because smart money concepts is kind of like the leader of the pack now in all of the analysis venues on all social media. And yes, it's viewed from a, it's a love it or, or hate it. There's no middle ground in it. And that's fine. That's good. There's liquidity. That, that has to happen. I don't expect, I never anticipated that everybody would love the things that I'm teaching or even me. And that's why I've always said, don't worship me. I'm not your hero. I have always been the anti-hero. I've championed demo accounts. I called myself the demo baller forever. And this year you saw a live account. Just in five weeks, over 100% return, even teaching drawdown resolution, problem areas, doing things incorrectly. You know, I had students ask me all the time, hey, what happens if you put a trade on until you hit the buy button and you want to really want to do the sell button? What do you do in that instant? Well, I've done that. I've done that several times throughout my career. And if anybody says they didn't do it, is a, is a liar. <laughs> I mean, it's simple as that. I mean, I've done it. You're going to do it too. Oh, oh, man. Especially if you're using those hot buttons up in the upper, hand, upper left hand corner on trading view. In fact, I almost did it this week. I was literally hovering over the wrong one. I'm like, whoa, what the hell am I doing? That's not what I wanted to do. So I kind of tell myself constantly, because usually I'm having my son next to me, try not to get in the conversation or, or talk when I'm getting ready to engage those entries or taking off partials, because I actually did that last month. I ended up trying to take up a partial off on a long. And instead of taking and selling, I ended up buying one more when it should have been a partial to come off. So what do you do in that instance? You correct it immediately. You don't even think about it. You just correct it immediately. So if you're looking to go in the marketplace long, this is an extra thing. This is a rabbit trail. So you, you get these in these live things with me. But if you're looking to go long and you make a mistake and you, and you hit this sell short, you know, you're entering in the wrong direction immediately. As soon as you realize you do that, don't look at the profit and loss and try to wiggle your way out of it. Oh, maybe it'll, no, don't do that. Don't do that, especially if you're learning from me, because if you're learning how to trade with my concepts, 
you probably won't get that opportunity because I'm teaching you where to get in right when the market's going to have an explosive move. So why the hell would you be messing around waiting to see if it's going to come back and cover your dealing spread? Okay, or allow you to cover for cost of, of commissions and fees. Fuck that. As soon as you make the mistake, get out. Just zero it out. Done. And maybe, maybe in most instances, especially if you're new, just watch the move that you were getting ready to participate in. Because when I was younger, I did that kind of stuff because I was in a rush. You know, I was in a rush to to get in there and 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 once we had activity that could be placed, you know. With a discount broker when I was trading with Lynn Waldock, um, $30 a round turn, which was great because I came from Fox Investments, which was, you know, $100 round turn. That, and that's, that was robbery. But, you know, that's what it cost to do one trade, one contract. It was $100. Now, imagine trying to do your 16 contracts full position on something like that. <laughs> you ain't doing it, brother. So you had to constantly shop around. And there was Ira Epstein and or Epstein or whatever it is. And then you had Lynn Waldock. And then you had uh there's one more on the top of my head. Uh no, I can't remember. And there was a third one that was really like the competitor, but anyway, Lynn Waldock became in like the, the best one everybody would flock to. And they had great service. You know, I never had an issue with them. And I don't know where I'm going with this one, so we're going to have to reel it back in. <laughs> but the point is, is if you make a mistake and you get in on the wrong side of the marketplace, just get out right away. There's no reason to be worrying about you know, taking a small little hit. But wait. If you're new, you haven't got the experience, this is where I was going. Um, sometimes when I was a younger guy, I would get in <clears throat> and I was thinking, okay, well, it's moving a little bit against what I would have been doing. And if it's moving in my favor a little bit, maybe I was wrong, right? Maybe I was wrong, and let me just see what happens with this. And then all of a sudden, it goes where my initial analysis was, but my stupidity in pressing the wrong button, getting in foolishly, hitting the wrong key, getting in, human error, and then trying to, well, maybe it was a, a, a good mistake. Maybe it was the universe you know, <laughs> helping and guiding me do do it the other way. And then, then I asked this guy, torn up from it so i've learned if you make a mistake and you enter on something that was not predetermined as far as the logic is why you went and did it just pull out of it get out of it don't worry about it just take whatever that little cost that paper cut get get it and just be done with it because you can see something turn violently against you and it would just be more demoralizing. It's simple. You know, you did your mistake, you get in, you did something wrong, get out. Who cares? I'm not going to beat myself up about something like that. But I did beat myself up about trying to stay with it on the instances where I tried to work out a way of covering the cost of commission. Because let's be honest, when I when I first started, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, I didn't come from riches. I didn't come from, you know, wealth. You know, one half of my family had money. But it was my father's side, and I had I had no access to that. You know, it was a, a grandfather that wasn't biologically mine. My, it wasn't my father's father, so he wasn't entitled to anything. In fact, nobody got anything from him. You know, when they died, you know, everything went into uh, their children, his biological children. So I didn't have any advantages in that regard. So when I had losing positions. Or if I had a loss of any kind, they were monumental. Like they did major psychological damage to me. But because I'm obsessively compulsive and I have a lot of other issues in my hard wiring that doesn't make me the perfect person, it would cause me to do things to be more aggressive about trying to get it back faster and inspire me to never quit. Sometimes I would be beaten down and my account would be dusted and, and blown. Like seriously, like there that was very hard for me to save up money to get that account started again. And then in a matter of two days, maybe three days of doing you know, full of shit, chasing you know the grain markets, trying to think that just because the market was showing me a reversal of the normal carrying charge market where I teach and the nearby contract should be 
cheaper than the next one out and going further. Well, every time I saw that inversion, because I learned this from Larry Williams and because I watched it in a video, I thought I understood it. Okay. And I looked and saw the commercials were above the zero line on the net trader position chart. So naturally, what does that mean? Every time that the Williams percent R was in oversold condition, that was when you buy it. That's what I was thinking that was all I had to do. And I would be buying it, expecting it to go into limit up moves and it would keep going down and stay oversold on the Williams percent R and keep going down and keep going down and I'd buy more and it would keep going down. And then I would trade now without a stop loss because, you know, I know I'm right. I just don't want to get stopped out and it just keeps going down and all of a sudden the account's gone. I did that shit when I was younger. Okay. I did all that dumb shit because I didn't know how to trade. I didn't know how the markets book. I didn't know what the market is going to do. After those conditions present themselves, you still have to get in there and wait for structure to change to support that bullish idea. See, I didn't know any of that stuff. I just figured, well, the indicator says this, the market's showing that we're in a commercial bull market based on what Larry Williams taught, and I got money in my account, so fuck it, it's casino time. And <laughs> I was looking at an account statement saying zero or just a couple dollars in the account. And it would suck. Like it would suck because I was thinking to myself, you know, I know I can do this. It's just, I got to find a way to get in alignment with the market. I got to find a way. How does the market give me clues, indications that this is in fact the time to be doing something? And you know, I watched that video I put up yesterday that was like a two minute something. And I had people commenting to me on TradingView and in, uh, in the YouTube comment section. I wish I could see the, the video, you know, at a slower pace. And I had a lot of, you know, robots and bots and sock puppeting from my favorite fan in Texas uh, saying it was cherry picked. But, you know, it's like this, folks. TradingView follows me on, on Twitter which I'm honored. Thank you so much. If you're listening, uh, bar chart follows me on Twitter too. Thank you. Good. Thank you guys. I appreciate that as well. Uh, both of those services, I actually use them. Uh, I feel that they're great. They're not paying me. It's not a commercial for them, but if I was doing something in trading view that isn't available to everyone else, and if it wasn't real time, I would expect trading view to step forward and say, inner circle trader, that isn't a live thing. In fact, I might even invite them after this in a tweet and say, hey, is this what real time looks like on your platform? Because there's people that say that that's market replay and you can't do, as far as I can see, I've not been able to find any way to do a trade when you're looking at market replay. And market replay screen looks different once, you're, once you engage, it's different. But putting all that aside, I, I know that when you as a student see me do those trades and you think wow man if i could just get like that okay then life's going to change for me well i'm, I'm going to explain something to you when i first started i didn't think what i'm able to do now was even possible i'm going to say that one more time and it's not bragging i want you to really listen to what i'm saying here when i first started even when I figured out what it is that I wanted to focus in on, I did not believe that I would be able to do what you're able to see me do now. It took a lot of time to get to this point. And when you see people like a Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods, which are real goats, okay? These men are, they're, they're the epitome. They're, that's the upper echelon. Like you can't get better than them. That's it. That's that, that they are it. They didn't get to that skill level right from Jump Street. They didn't just walk out there and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to be this great at it. I, I wasn't like that. Like I failed a lot. I blew lots of accounts. I tried changing stuff around. I tried taking things out of what I felt was working. Maybe that would make you an example of improvement that would be notable. And like I said, I figured it out like two and a half, three years into it. I knew what I had, but I was tinkering around with it. Wasted you know, three more years of bullshit, you know, back testing and, and theory testing and putting money in accounts. And, and I would run money up and then crash and burn, run money up and crash and burn because I'm trying to figure out the optimal settings for everything. 
And I'm also doing things automated with easy language. Trade station. You know, all these things, you know, these, these cuts, you know, death by a thousand cuts. Well, those thousand cuts didn't kill me. They make me a fucking animal today. Okay. I have scar tissue so thick. It's like bulletproof and wrecking ball proof too, bitch. Okay. I can literally walk into any setting, any venue, whether it be in front of the CFTC, SEC, FTA, courts, public opinion, whatever the fuck you want to bring. I can prove this stuff and I would gladly do it. I would gladly do it. I would go on CNBC and do that shit live in front of everybody. Give me the opportunity. My ass will be in a car driving up the road and you'll see me on there with a t-shirt, alcoholic. Think I won't? Test me. See, I won't do it. <laughs> They'll be hiring me. There's our new anchor, ICT on CNBC. Join us every morning in ICT's. <laughs> anyway, I'm just fucking with you. But I would do it. I am not lying. I'm telling you, give me an opportunity. I will make a show of it openly. Just to thumb my nose at all the doubters. I would love it. And win new friends. But anyway, <laughs> the, the folks that uh, are looking forward to next year thinking it's going to be a magical transformation for you, you're still going to have to work your ass off. Okay. The only thing I'm lending you is the 30 years perception and experience. That's it. That's it. You're still going to be complaining that I didn't tell you when to buy. You're still going to complain that I didn't tell you where to put a stop loss. You're still going to be complaining where the best partials would be and what amount of partials. See, all those things have to be a unique decision. I didn't understand it either. Okay, it doesn't sound like that's how it should work. It sounds like, well, it should, it should be the same way for everyone. How the fuck is that even possible if it's the same for everyone? If everybody's doing the same fucking thing, how can there be liquidity on the other side of it? You see what I'm saying? That's also the argument that I'm going to pose to you in a little while when we start talking about that one tick stop loss. Yeah, we're going there. But I want you to think about how you're going to wreck yourself next year in the learning process because you're going to try to put more than I'm willing to put on you as your educator. As your mentor, I'm going to tell you where you should be focusing. When I tell you that, it doesn't mean, okay, well, I have extra time and extra energy. I'm going to take on this on top of it. What the hell? Don't do that. And I'm telling you, I've seen this with every group that I've ever had. Even before when I was doing one-on-one, -on -one, I had some students who would come in. They would listen, do exactly what I said, and they'd do well. And then I'd have these guys coming in and one lady who was like, I'm convinced she was a gambler, like straight up gambler. But they would come in and I'd say, okay, this is what you're supposed to be focusing on. And they only had one week with me. This is what you're focusing on. This is all you're going to do. And I would sit there and they would have to do it in front of me. And they would start doing other shit. You know, mess around here, mess around there, open their Blackberry up, scrolling through and looking at their emails. I'm like, do you see what the market's doing right now? Mm -hmm. You're not even looking at it. You're looking at your Blackberry. What the fuck are you doing? You, why are you here? You want to learn how to do this? The Blackberry's not going to tell you to fucking buy. Why are you looking at that? Put that shit down and look at the chart. The chart's going to tell you when, when you're supposed to be doing something. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Fuck, I'm, I know I'm right. You're here to learn from me. Why are you not listening to me? So it's very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Trust me, some of you wouldn't have been able to deal with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And you all want it, but you wouldn't want it. Trust me, once you sat in the seat next to me. My own kids don't fucking want to deal with it. Yep, that's the way it is growing up ICT. So... <laughs> So we ha we've had a, a wonderful year of learning. I've had so much fun, and I promised you that you would see precision. I promised you that I would show you, and I waited to the last day of the year, and it's typical of me, and it? I walked you through a top-down approach, and you're all encouraged to go and look at the longer rendition of that little short video from yesterday when I recorded the PM session. If you go into that... Um, what is the video description box underneath the YouTube video? If you click on that, it'll it'll maximize and show you my whole you know, dialogue there. And I give you the actual link that begins the thread on my Twitter feed. If you click on that, it'll take you step by step from the very first tweet all the way through all the 
the charts. I go from the daily chart, four hour, six, uh, 60 minute chart, 15 minute chart, and a five minute chart. Okay. And I state very plainly that those are the levels that I'm going to work with for today. Now, the backdrop behind that was, and this is also included in those tweets, nothing was deleted. I don't ever delete a tweet ever. I make mistakes. I'll either admit something or type something wrong and I'll add it in in an additional tweet, but I'm not deleting anything. Nothing is hidden. I'm not hiding anything. No double one direction this way, one direction that way. I'm not giving you two sides of you know, an outcome. And I said, okay, we're looking at very specific levels. Okay. And while it was important for you not to engage, because if you are engaging or pressing the button, you're going to be worrying about your stop loss getting hit or moving around instead of watching price, which is what I was guiding you through in the beginning before the 930 opening. So we were looking for that draw on liquidity and I'm not going to steal the thunder from it. You go and look at it and it hit it beautifully. I engaged the very thing that I teach you in my lessons, in, in real mentorship, okay? I drew your attention to a very specific thing in the charts, and you'll see it when you go through it. I engaged doing it, hit it, and then I aimed for the liquidity and that draw on liquidity level that you saw in your charts, and it was perfect. Perfect. You couldn't ask for anything better than that until the PM session. Because I know and I knew when I was teaching on Friday, I said, look, you know, you got to, you have to have some kind of a beginning point. So you all that are young and you're really just wanting to be like my examples, you want to be able to do that. Because I already know if I create monsters that can do what you watch me do on Friday, I'm going to tell you this right now, none of you are going to be able to do that next year. Okay. That's not going to happen. And, and that's not a, a, a knock against anybody's aptitude or intelligence. I'm just telling you from a realistic perspective, it took me decades to get this way. It, it didn't happen overnight. I didn't have it in my eighth year. I didn't have it in my 10th year. It didn't happen in year 10, 12, 15, okay, around 20-ish. Then it started like I was finding my groove. But you won't be able to trade like that in Forex. And that's why I said many times when I see these folks out there about two pip stop losses, okay, you're not going to trade with a one tick stop loss in Forex. You're not, okay? And if you start trading size, what size? Well, it's relative. But if you start trading with size and you're thinking that you're going to do consistently a use of a two pip stop loss or one pip stop loss and your broker's not going to open their spread to grab you, yeah, you're full of shit. That's exactly what they're going to do. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's why if you look across the spectrum of all those Forex brokers, everybody's high is different. Everybody's low is different because you're trading in their pool of liquidity. FXCM, you know, Forex.com, all of them have their own little servers. And every one of those servers have a different high and different low. But you're not seeing it because you're not looking at it comparatively. But open up two accounts in the same brokerage firm and see if you're not in two different servers. They're going to be slightly different. But you signed on knowing that. You can't bitch about it. When you signed up and you sign all those papers that you never fucking read, just like when you buy a house and you buy a car, you open up a bank account, you're giving the money to the bank. You don't realize it yet, but you are. And you're, they're promising that if we got opportunity to give your money back to you, we will. But there might not be a chance for that sometimes. And if, you, if we can't, then we're going to call your money an investment in the bank and we'll call it a good day. Thanks for your investment. See you later. Futures, bonds, S&P, NASDAQ, I'll go so far as to say Dow, but not as clean as ES and NASDAQ. Why don't I trade Dow? Because I can't fucking stand it. I look at it like the dollar. It's just a barometer. It helps me confirm something against the other averages. I don't look at Russell. Okay, I think it's garbage. You don't need it. Uh, the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the ES. That's it. You need one triad. Three markets that are closely correlated, that's it. So when we look at precision elements in price action, uh, you're not going to find anything cleaner than stock indices and bonds. There's nothing cleaner. 
there's no other market out there that's cleaner. It's also the reason why I can't stand crypto because crypto is a full of shit market. Like it, it's it's got look how long Bitcoin's is hanging around that narrow sideways channel. How many of you are losing your mind over that shit? That would drive me nuts. Like that that kind of shit. Ugh. That reminds me of silver. You know, decades ago, silver would just do that. And then everybody would be right, making courses and books and shit. Uh, silver is going to have a historical breakout. It's going to be in a long, narrow, sideways channel. Well, and it's all the bullshit I learned from Ken Roberts, or Ken Roberts rather, and lost my ass. First trade, fifty percent gone. <laughs> that shit don't work. Okay, that's like gambling. That's like scratch offs, lottery tickets, the Powerball. You ever notice how the Powerball, since they did that uh, scam job, and they said somebody won the two billion dollars. Uh, first of all, they didn't do a drawing, and it's like slowly creeping up because nobody wants to buy a ticket they're pissed off they'll buy the um make a million but they're not doing powerball you see how easy it is for me to get distracted and you want me to do a live stream and answer questions and watch the market too Fuck that i can't do it <laughs> you're gonna have to just watch what i'm doing i'll talk about it before it happens and there it is but I, I can't i can't answer questions while i'm doing live streams but you're gonna have an invitation to be a part of a interactive learning process i'm gonna do my best to try to make it so that way you have to see it yourself and listening to my dialogue when it's salient. So when you're watching the price charts with me live on YouTube, I'll prompt your attention to certain things. And then I'll tell you, screenshot this. If you can't be there live when you're watching the replays, at that moment, pause the video and screenshot it. OK, if you don't do those types of things, you're not going to get the results that you're probably hoping for, at least not the results that I'm aiming for. If you do what I'm telling you to do, you will learn amazing things next year. You'll have a better understanding about what, what I do in the mornings and in the afternoons. How do I how do I get my bias? How do I know what I'm looking for? How do I know if I should be trading today or not? What happens if I feel like I think this is a day I'm going to trade and then things change that takes my willingness to want to trade away and then I don't want to do anything? See, that's mentoring. That's the real shit that books can't do. A one-week workshop can't do. You have to be with someone that knows how to do it, that's done it more than just in the last year. I got funded account. I'm going to start doing a mentorship. Fuck, get the hell out of here. You're teaching ICT stuff, so just stop. Save everybody's time and money. Give them their link to my channel, and it's done. It's easier. They'll respect you more in the end. But Friday, I went through the top-down approach. I went through the daily chart with you, and I mentioned in the narrative of everything Think about what yesterday was. Okay, I prompted this in a tweet. I said, think about what has been going on. Who's been making money recently? The shorts. The market's been bearish. It's gone down. Yes, we had a, a rally off the lows on the daily chart, but year-end squaring of positions. That means folks that are holding positions that, you know, for taxable income and things of that nature, if they're holding positions, uh, what positions are they likely to be squaring up towards the close of the day? Well, if you're short or predominantly short, when people are closing positions on a short, they have to do what? They have to buy. So that's already a built-in advantage. So now think about why I said 38.64. Note that. Relative equal high. Note that. And I left you in the morning session. What did I teach you in the 2022 mentorship when it starts to trade in the afternoon session? You use the lunchtime liquidity. Where are the stops? If it's been going down, where are the stop losses in buy side above that lunch hour? The market's going to gravitate towards that. Unless it's a strong one directional trending day, which isn't always the case. You have to be a trader working in markets that are not like that. But if it's one direction, there's a big tear off right from the beginning type day, you, know, you either got to be in it from the beginning or you're done. <laughs> just just leave, let it go. But if it doesn't have any kind of like real retracements of any kind, that's what I'm referring to. Those types of days, unless you're in at the beginning of the move, it's better just as this turn it off, come back the next day or whatever. But that's not what it feels like you should do at the time. You want to chase it or you'll spend all day waiting for a retracement that never comes. It just keeps melting or keeps 
barreling higher. Those days cause people to blow their accounts because they chase and they chase and they chase. And even knowing that they shouldn't do it, they put on a bigger position to make up for the fact that they didn't get in at the earlier point. And in any little retracement of, of any single candle or two, which is insignificant in the grand scheme of that move, they collapse the trade because they can't handle it. And it still keeps pressing on. You've been there before, haven't you? I know what that feels like. I did that shit in oats. Oats, thin, shitty ass market in, in commodities. I did that. <laughs> and it was in a mood that just kept moving and moving and moving. And because I was trying to make up for the fact that I didn't get in when I knew I should have, I put it in a bigger position than I should have. And every one cent move is 50 bucks, kind of like an ES. And when you're carrying 15 contracts and you can't really carry that much in terms of margin, it doesn't take long to scare you out of the trade. And four cents, five cents, it was enough for me. I had to I had to bail it. And it would still keep going in the direction if I just would have held on to it. Never went to what I would have used as a stop loss, but I couldn't weather that pain. 20-year-old, man. 20-year-old, no clue what real money was. You know, wet behind the ears in life. <laughs> you know, freshly divorced. I had a chip on my shoulder. I had all the things that you kind of complain to me about if we were sitting at the bar. OK, you want to give me the reasons why you're not successful. Your father hated you. Your mother disowned you. Your wife cheated on you. Everybody's, you know, hated you and shit on your entire life. Dude, I have I have all that stuff. OK, I got all that shit. And that's none of that. None of it's an excuse for you not to be able to be successful with this. None. I was homeless. OK, trust me, I'm telling you, there's nothing you're going to be able to bring to this con conversation that says that this is a verifiable reason why you can't make it work. Because that's bullshit. You have to have the tenacity to say, I'm going to deal with it and stick with it and understand that like what I did on Friday, walking you through the daily chart. And I outlined the fact that we are in what? The last day of the year. Now, the narrative I gave you and the, the reasons for it was this last trading day of the year. There, we're not expecting a lot of volatility, but let's note it. The previous day's high and the previous day's low. Which one's likely to get hit? Well, if you consider the fact that we're in our last trading day, it's a Friday, there isn't going to be new positions barreling in there. There isn't going to be this big rush to, I got to get in here. There's going to be a big move. Not on the last trading day of the year, they're, they're not going to have that. So that means what? We're likely to have an inside day. How do I, how did I know that? How, I'm sure you're probably asking, like, I hope he has answers. Why, how do you know it's going to be inside day? Well, what I'm, I've already said and what I've explained thus far, but we also opened below previous day's low. I'm sorry, below previous day's high and above previous day's low. So at 8.30, when we start looking for something, and at 9.30, those two time periods are important. There's two hours of the morning session that you have to be in front of your charts between 8.30 in the morning and 9.30 in the morning, all up to like 10, like 10.30. I guess technically what? that's. Yes, it's two hours. That's your morning session. Now, if you haven't found a setup by then, don't. There you go. There's 80% of your losing trades now been removed. If you chase something outside of that two-hour window, if you haven't found anything yet, don't. Wait for the PM session. How did I know that? Dozens of blown accounts. When I stopped doing that shit, I stopped wrecking myself. It's chasing things. That's all you're doing. It's FOMO, fear of missing out. Oh, I got to get in something. I've been here two fucking hours. So what's two hours in the whole career lifetime of you trading? It's shit. It's nothing. Movies are longer than that for fuck's sake. And you're trying to make a big deal about two hours of sitting in front of the charts and did nothing. You got chart time. You got experience. Stop looking at that as, I didn't get anything out of it. See, that's the right now. Wook crowd perspective. And oh shit, I probably stepped in some shit right there. I don't care. This generation is too fucking lazy. And you're going to have to find a way to fix that lazy ass if you're going to make money in this. Because even ICT can't fix lazy ass. It, that lazy ass syndrome, if you bring that into this industry, you're done. You're done. There's no way you're going to be able to cope with the wrestling match that this is going to put on you. And when you lose, you're going to feel like it's something that was done to you undeservingly when it was you that invited it.
because you're doing something in a hurry, ill-equipped, you don't know what you're doing, you're rushing, and you expect it to be easy for you. Let me tell you something, it's not easy. It's not easy. Once you learn your model and you know what it feels like to get your ass burned and you know the consequences of doing stupid shit, you know boundaries. It's kind of like that yellow double line in the road. Don't cross that son of a bitch because if you do, you know what's going to happen. Bad stuff. And you might not be here long after doing it. You're going to have to be personally responsible and making decisions where financial success or ruin is all on you. All on you. A lot of you that are young don't like to weigh that out and say, you know what? It really is all on me. Yeah. And that's a terrifying feeling. And me being in a live session with you next year is not going to remove that. In fact, for those that are going to make the mistake of trying to take a live trade based on what I'm saying live, you're really going to be shitting yourself. Because once you put the trade on, and I'm not saying the things you want to be talking, want me to be talking about, you're going to see, like I say, for instance, I'll paint a picture for you. Say I'm calling the market to a specific high above market price. And I'm saying, I believe the market sentiment right now is prime for a run on buy side liquidity. And I have this level here. Let's study this. Right away, some of you are going to be like, oh, shit. That's, the, that's it. Daddy just gave me the invitation. I'm going in. How much margin can I afford? Right there, you done fucked up. Number one, you're trying to press a button instead of watching price and learning to read each individual candle. Not, I just bought it. I don't even know where I should have bought it, but I heard him say it's going up and I got time and I got to get back to work. I'm on my smoke break. If my boss sees me fucking with this phone, I'm going to get fired. I can't afford to get fired yet until I learn how to make this money because this year I'm going to over leverage my funded account and I'm going to be independently wealthy and I'm going to get worried about this shit. But I'm going, to, I'm going all in. You're laughing right now, but you know damn well that's what you thought you were going to do. And you shouldn't. Don't do that. You're not going to understand how to read price if you do that because if you go in – and let's just say you foolishly press the button and you get an, even a small position. The smallest leverage you can afford to put on or the broker will allow you. And then you're in there. You're going to be watching the profit and loss going up and down, not reading the individual candles like I want you to do. See, you've got to get yourself in sync with how these markets book. Minute by minute second by second, interval by interval. You cannot be a divided mind. You can't have your attention elsewhere and learn properly. If you're watching that PML tab on your open position while I'm doing a live stream, you're fucking doing it wrong. And you are going to fail, even if that trade makes profit. Because once I pack it in, and the close of 2023 comes, and you have to do this all by yourself, it's going to feel like the weight of the world is crushing on you. You're going to be scared shitless when you have to make the decision on your own because you've wasted your time trying to catch what you're thinking is easy money. Instead of taking the opportunity and placing it in all of your hands to learn how to do this in an, in an environment that is safe, you can't hurt yourself. You can't hurt yourself. Now, it might bruise your ego for some of you that thought you knew how to trade. And when you see the things that I'm going to teach you, that's fine. You can come back from that. But it's real hard to come back from putting money behind a, a trade that you don't even know why it's likely to move. You're just trusting me. Don't trust me. Not on, my, not on the face value. You, you want to go into the charts and do it. See it. Earn your own personal trust in these concepts. And that's why I've always openly challenged. Don't take my word for it. Go in there and try to debunk it. Notice how no one's ever been able to successfully do that. <laughs> yeah, because you can't. I am the algorithm. I am the author. It's mine. And I know it. And I am welcoming you all to join me and I will share it. I will show you all these little pieces that come together. And you'll find one good opportunity per week. That's your career. Everything else, 
that's all on you. But you want to find a way to outpace inflation? You don't have to pay me for that. I'm going to teach you how to use what I've already given you. Where is there a better deal in town? Where is there anyone else out there making it this accessible with proof that it has precision that's unrivaled? You see, I've waited for this entire year to finish because I couldn't wait the latest on you. Because I know some of you have woke up to, wow, this, this, this shit is it. Like, this is the real thing. Yeah, it really is. And I'm the real thing. And I've always been the real thing. I didn't have to go out there and dance and perform and show everything that I can afford to own. And I didn't have to show you any live accounts, but I did. I showed you precision. I went in a live stream, I think twice this year, and called the very fair value gap and where it's going to go. I did it. Oh, that's just a cherry pick. No, it's not cherry picked. It's right then and there. You all have probably seen leaked videos of my mentorship where I was giving analysis and I've received lots of emails over the years saying, I want to join. I've seen leaked comments of your commentaries and I looked at the charts and it did exactly what you said. Please let me join. No. No, you don't need to. I'm going to be on YouTube. I don't do analysis for my private group anymore. So stop fucking asking me. You can't join that. It's, it's just them enjoying each other's company and they're a community. They earn that spot. That's where it is. But there's no, it's, there's no secret analysis. I'm making it public. I'm literally laying it in your hands. What are you going to do with it this year? Are you going to sit around and try to take pop shots at it and find fault with it? Or are you just going to really say, you know what? I'm going to take this guy at his word and he's going to make it available. I'm going to see if there's any validity to it. I'm going to do everything he says and let's see what happens. That's all I'm asking you to do. No PayPal, no credit card, no coupon codes, nothing. Because I already know, I already know I'm going to have a legion of new believers that are able to do this on their own. And my wife and my family and I will be reading all of the success stories like I've been reading this entire fall all the way through. I'm getting letters. I'm getting. These are real people, folks, bringing up that, hey, look, this is what I've done. And I, I have nothing else to thank except for the stuff I've watched on your YouTube channel this year. This is amazing. I've been doing this for 15 years and I've never made money. Now, with watching what you've put on YouTube, I'm making money. I'm funded. I got $400,000 in funded accounts and I'm taking withdrawals. How do, you, how do you argue against that? And when you're one of those types of people, is it going to matter who doesn't like ICT or what you do or think it's fake? <laughs> you're not going to give a flying fuck what anybody thinks. You're making bread. And you're breaking bread. It's not going to make any difference what anybody thinks. They're not spending your money. You're spending it. And you're able to do it without ICT. That's what I want. I don't want glad handing. I don't want people holding on to me saying, you know, I, you know, I need you to do this. No, you don't. You don't. I don't run a service where you got to keep paying me because I think that's unethical. I don't charge people anymore. I could. I could make a fucking ton of money right now. I have money. I want to live the latter stages of my life principle oriented and have a clean conscience that the things that I've known for years that I was told not to share with anybody else, I had to create a language. In that language, I have, it wasn't easy. Let's, let's be honest. It wasn't easy for me to try to bridge what it was that goes on versus what could be talked about and not get me in trouble. Oh, what do you mean by that? You're not supposed to know this stuff. So if I make up, well, terms and uses of theories that would be very, very close, very, very, very close, okay, to what the actual algorithms do in the marketplace. Now, when I say algorithms, there's two of them that 
dance together. The engine that runs price, that is the algorithm. How does that work with smart money algorithms that engage price engines? Where do they enter their orders? Where do they adjust their orders? Where do they close their orders? See, that's that synergy between both of them that I had to create a language to be able to communicate how that happens and not divulge what has been given to me that you are never going to learn. Oh, here we go with this Tom Clancy shit. I don't give a fuck if you believe it or not. You explain how I can do what I can do and find it anywhere else in any other fucking theory or retail horseshit or some super power engine, you black box horseshit that doesn't work. I know it sounds arrogant, but it, it, it annoys me that people see the obvious and they still, still can't see it. <laughs> I'm going to literally sit down with you and map out every one minute and five minute candle, real time, two times a week. You're going to see it. You're going to walk it with me every fucking candle. Nobody does that but me. And I'm looking forward to it because I know jaws are going to be hitting the floor. People are going to be shitting and falling back in it because they're going to be like, damn, this, this guy is exa exactly what he said he was. Yep. And I never had to be more than what you saw. And here's the, here's the kicker. Even after this, there's still going to be people out there and they're going to say, yeah, but he didn't do this. He didn't trade in front of you. He didn't do this and that. See, these are the same people that have sorry ass win records. Their stats suck. They can only over leverage and gamble. And they call that skill. That's not skill. I'm not a 50 50 trader. Notice that I don't want to have a 50 50 strike rate. I don't want to operate or engage in an environment that invites only that as a possible outcome. I want to be in there when the stage is set for me to obviously get everything I could possibly garner as an odds in my favor. And you not knowing those things right now is, is a cause for you to feel anxious. Like I'm hiding something from you. I can promise you all the things that I'm never going to divulge past what I've already done. I never, ever have to teach those things. I have simplified things like there, there are simple macros in the marketplace that run every single day and you can find them and make money. That's what I was talking about with that five handle move. You can find a five handle move every single fucking day. I don't give a shit if it's seek and destroy. I don't care if it's a trending day, if it's a consolidation day, if it's a classic buy day, classic sell day, it doesn't matter. I can go in and you can too, after 2023, you'll be able to five, find a five handle move. That's 20 ticks in the S&P. You can make a career out of that. What if you parlay that up and use money management to build it up, build it up, build it up. As you make more money, it allows you and affords you to do what? Carry more contracts and not increase the percentage of risk. It stays the same. What does that mean? Well, let's say you start with a hypothetical funded account of $10,000, okay? Oh, and you can't make a lot of money with $10,000. Well, Larry Williams did in one year. You, you can't make what? You don't think you can make tenfold on that over a course of a year? I think you can. I believe it's possible. So stop listening to these fucking people that say you have to have $300,000 of funded account to make money. Bullshit. Last time we talked, I said, what if you get that funded account for 100,000 and you just make one and a half percent a week? That's 6% per month. Compounded over the year, that's 100%. That means you made six figures, $100,000. Tax it. You probably got about anywhere, it depends upon where you're at in, in the United States. And I can only talk from the United States perspective. And barring any kind of, you know, special tax treatment, the likelihood of you getting uh, trader status in the first year of trading is not likely. You have to have a track record. So you have what, hundred thousand tax it. You probably got anywhere between sixty-eight thousand and seventy-two thousand dollars. 
That's a good living, folks. That's a good living. Now, if you just did that every every year and you did nothing more than that, are you failing? Did you miss the mark? How do you rate in your social media equity curve amongst your friends and family on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram? Do you feel like you're not up to snuff with them? Stop worrying about them, motherfuckers. 90% of these people don't even make money. 90% of them can't fucking trade. And if they are with a little bit of money, they've made their money selling shit. And I've been very open and honest with you. I have made more money selling education than I did my live trading. It's easy. People pile in. They want to learn. They'll pay. They'll pay. They'll pay. Trades you have to wait for. You have to wrestle through. You have to wait, lose, come back, lose. It, it's a lot. And when you learn how to trade and do well, guess what? If you want to use that as an income source, I don't think there's anything. It's just because I stopped doing it just to prove a point to everybody because, oh, you know, he makes his money doing this. Okay, well, I'll, I'll stop doing that. But these same fuckers are out there trying to sell new shit. <laughs> oh, shit. With 12 year old furniture in your house, dusty as shit. So you have all kinds of potential income streams laid at your feet once you know how to do this. You could be in fund management. You can be in prop firm. You can educate. You can do signal services. You can do YouTube channels. I mean, there's nothing limiting you. Once you learn how to do this the right way and you can manage yourself efficiently, effectively, and manage risk properly, there isn't a living soul on this planet that wouldn't be at least interested in see what you're doing. They don't have to subscribe to your views of it. For people that don't, look at this way. For people that couldn't afford my mentorship, they still watch my videos on YouTube. For the people that don't want to watch my YouTube videos, they still read my tweets. Doesn't matter. You have an audience. I have an audience. So there's a way for you to monetize this skill set in so many ways. And it not hinge on you making your trading income support you initially. That's the major thing that I want you to understand because, see, you're all trying to get rich real, real quick. And I'm not promising you that. I've never done that. I've always taught have modest expectations. Back on baby pips. Try to get 25 pips a week. Yeah. 25 pips a week. And if you're risking 2%, each trade, it builds up nicely. I shared a spreadsheet. It did all the math for you. Oh, here we go. Spreadsheets. Okay. Go back to Friday and show you what, see what I did. I outlined it in detail. Where the levels were going to be, where it's going to go. Inside day, why it happened? You thought I forgot about that. <laughs> The likelihood of the market not going above Thursday's high and below Thursday's low on the last trading day is highly likely to stay inside the range. So if it's going to stay inside the range, it's going to be what? An inside day. No new positions are going to be pushing the range beyond Thursday's high or below Thursday's low. So right away, we have adjusted our mindset to we are not looking for a big breakout move because it's not likely to occur. Why? Because it's the last trading day of the year. It's Friday. And we're in the middle of a small consolidation on the daily chart anyway. Go look at your chart. Go look at the charts I shared. You'll see that. Now, that idea of looking for an inside day forces us to do what? Trade with internal range liquidity. So that means we have to work within the previous day's high and the low. And then anytime we take a trade and we trade outside of a new range, what does that mean? All the levels that I gave you going through the daily, the four hour, the 60 minute, the 15 minute and five minute charts, I gave you all the fair value gaps, the discount low and the premium high of each one. And I took you top down into the smallest five minute fair value gap. Now, your charts probably don't have it extended through to the PM session. Take those ranges, extend them all the way into the three o'clock, into four o'clock. And then look at where I was buying. Look at where my stop loss was. <laughs> I 
one tick stop loss. I was not worried about that coming down and hitting my stop loss. Why? Why was I not worried about it? And why did I go in and buy more when it went down to the bottom of that fair value gap on the five minute? I'm sorry, on the one minute chart. Because everything was sitting on that 60 minute discount low of the fair value gap. Look at the look at the range on the 60 minute chart and where I drew out on those charts that I shared on Twitter, the discount low of that fair value gap. Extend that through into three o'clock and four o'clock hour. And then I have to have my notes here. I don't want to say anything incorrectly. If you look at the 11 minutes after three, everything, your chart should be on New York time. Okay. So it, and you see me doing because I had premeditated all these conversations. I showed, I click on New York, showing you this is a New York time. Make sure your charts look like this because our conversation I'm having right now, which I had planned all this stuff. Look at the 11 minutes after three. Okay. And it fits on New York time. It's going to be 15. 11 to 15, 13. That's your one minute fair value gap. Now, if you look at the low on the one minute chart at 15, 25, 15, 27, and 15, 30, respectively in local New York time, that would be three o'clock, 25 minutes after, three o'clock, 27 minutes after, three o'clock, 30 minutes after. Those three lows went exactly to the low of that one minute fair value gap. It did not need to go beyond that because we've already rested on the 60 minute discount low of the fair value gap on the hourly chart. We consolidated in that larger fair value gap in that 15 minute time frame, And I layered all those fair value gaps. So in layman's terms, this is what was going on. The market dove deep after my trade in the morning getting the five handles. Knowing full well by doing that, it would set the stage for trolls to say, five handles, ha, ha, ha. They're not getting five handles consistently, but this is continuing our conversation. Five handles is enough for you to make lots of money, lots and lots and lots of money. You can make all, kind, all the money you'd ever need or want can be made off of five handles. So don't be discouraged by me or other people showing beyond five handles. You have to have something that you can reach for that's realistic. So what happens if you get five handles? Trust me, I know I'm going to continue on with the whole why I get stopped out. But I have to make this point here. Like I said, I've got notes, folks. I'm not going to leave anything untouched. Five handles can be done one time a day easily. You can really do it every session. Morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon. That's 10 trading opportunities per week. If you can nail down five handles, how many handles is that over the week? 50. Now, what if you aim for 50, but you just average around 25? Because you're learning and, you're, and your strike rate, not my, your strike rate is 50-50. You, are you failing? No. No. Your goal, your model is to aim for that. I have a model that I'm looking for. When I was, well, I'm not trading actively Forex now, but I was looking for 50 to 75 pips every single week. I could do lots more, clearly, but it was easy for me to do it. It doesn't put pressure on me, and I have lots of ways to get it. I can get it from one setup. I can do one shot, one kill. If I don't get the one shot, one kill because I was either not on the charts or I didn't do it right or I just missed the opportunity or whatever, then I have to break that up over the course of one other trading day or multiple trading days or trading sessions. And I'm not forcing myself to go in there and try to squeeze an unrealistic expectation of 50 to 75 handles from a day that isn't likely to move that much, which is the point of what Friday's discussion was in the morning. Last trading day of the year, E-mini S&P, it's going to be an inside day. It proved to be an inside day. Now, if you can get those five handles one time a day and you trade Monday through Friday and you don't get caught up in trying to keep up with everybody else on YouTube, or whatever other medium out there that's going to lull you into thinking that you need to be doing more because they're still doing something. Oh, this guy over here, he caught 10, 10 handles over here. I, I got I to get in here and do some more because it's, it's, it's really moving today. Stop. Stop. Listen, the banks are open from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock, Monday through Friday, unless it's a bank holiday. And there's money going in those fucking bank accounts all the time. People are going in and making deposits, and they're doing withdrawals. Just because that's all going on. Do you got to run to the bank? 
You got more money to put in the bank? You got more money to pull out of the bank just because everybody else is doing it. Stop trying to do things because you see business as usual everywhere else. That's them doing their thing. You're running your business. Your business has business hours. What is it? 8.30 to 10.30. If you stay inside those two hours, I promise you, all the bullshit that you're struggling with will go away. And if you just wait to the last hour, 3 o'clock to 4, that's it. There's your three-hour work week. Do one scanning on one particular day, a medium impact news event or a high impact news event. You look 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning. If you can't find it there, wait till the afternoon. Especially if the morning is shit, you're probably going to have a really good PM session. Something will happen real easy because it, it likes to give the smart money a cookie, it being the algorithm. So I'm dropping all kinds of diamonds in here, folks. And if you're not taking notes, man, you're really wasting the opportunity. It's being recorded in case you can't be here for the whole time, but just you know, just know that this is some really good shit. I would have paid money for this stuff coming up. I actually did lots of it. I lost lots of money in accounts learning this shit. So, but five handles, if you do that every single day, that's 25 handles a week. So you can do a approach of looking for a trade, a swing trade of 25 handles to aim for it. And if you can't find it, if you're not skilled to be able to find a move like that on an hourly chart or four hour chart, no problem, break it up. What happens if you get two 12 and a half handle moves? There's nothing wrong with that. You can find that on a 15 minute chart. But what happens if you don't have that much skill to do it like that either? And you're, you're really trying to do that one minute chart because you don't like to be in there too long. You want to get in there, do your surgical strikes and get out because you're scared and you haven't built up enough confidence yet. I understand, no problem. Go for five. Go, personally, I go five and a quarter. Caleb, that's his model. He does five and a quarter. So once he gets five and a quarter, he's done. He's not looking at the charts no more. He's done. And I can't I can't get him to sit with me anymore after that. Once he's done, he's done. I'm like, right, now watch this. Now, Dad, I'm done. I'm like, but I want to show him some more shit. And he's like, Dad, you told me. I'm like, I know, but I just love this shit. <laughs> I want you to see this. I get I get really passionate about it. And even though he's still growing in his understanding, I want him to be sick, like a monster. Like I want to take what I have in my head and put it in him and with his youth. And he has a lot of the things that I have too. Like you tell him no, he's going to find a way to do it. You tell him you, he can't, he's going to find 12 ways he can. So I know if I can instill what I know in him, he will make me look like a neophyte because he has the time doing more of what I already know. It, it just, I, I'm, it's very hard for me to manage him because I don't want to push too hard and like, like drive him nuts, but also don't want to be so hands off that he limits himself. You know what I mean? So it's, it's like a, I'm an ICT and dad competing to be the better of the each you know i want to be the best dad i can by not forcing it on him and i want to be typical me ict where i want to cram it down your throat and it's over and over and over and over again too much and you now you're choking on it and you're going to have it my way you know <laughs> so it's it's very hard for me to manage that so but as a five handle trader that's a realistic expectation for you to have and if you're really, really new by doing tape reading, you can grow in your confidence and say, okay, I see a setup that might yield five handles. But what happens if I go in and I get in the move and I get out with two and three quarters and I just get out and I watch it go to five and then I do the same thing in the afternoon. Guess what that is? It's five handles and you don't have that much time in the marketplace. It lets you get in, get out. It rewards you and you grow in your confidence. Is there something wrong with that? No, not if you are so new as a trader that your experience level doesn't permit you the confidence or comfort, let's say it that way, to be in the risk that's associated with being in the market live. So you, you put your toe in the water, you feel if it's too hot, if it's too hot, you, if it's moving around real quick, you go in, get your two and three quarters move and then bail out. And watch and see if it goes to the five handles. And if it does, you'll grow in your confidence. That, okay, if I just would have held on to it, it would have done that. Not thinking, 
oh, I wish I would have held on to it. Why'd I do that? No, see, it, it's how you log and journal. You retain the positives and you don't record any of the negative stuff. Because when you record it in your journal, negative, your subconscious retains that. And you anchor a toxic event around something you're trying to grow as a positive investment for your life. So you're shooting yourself in the foot, basically. You're trying to turn something you've been motivated to do for a positive thing, you're turning it toxic without realizing it. So that's why it, you're, you're, you're sugarcoating all of your journal experiences. You want it to be a love story to yourself. You're writing a love note to yourself every trading day, and you're doing it through charts. You're showing charts, and you're putting little, I love what I'm doing. This is great that I can see this, and you're retaining that. Your brain loves that kind of stuff. Your brain loves it. It releases chemicals into your body that remembers it better than just the static memory of it alone. Think about it. When you went to a movie, maybe you've already seen this movie, okay? And you went there and you saw it with your friends. You saw it, it was all right, okay? And you were meeting this girl or significant other. And they said, hey, look, you know, I really would like to see this movie. And you're thinking, oh, fuck, I've already seen this movie. All right, well, they want to go. I don't want to be a jerk. Let me, let's just go with them. And you go to the movie and you have a great time. They're holding their hand and they're, you know, the, the experience there. And now all of a sudden that movie has a positive attachment to your memory versus, yeah, I saw it. It was all right. Now you got somebody that's nice to you, that smells next to you. It's like beautiful and it's just. It's a totally different experience. And now you add to it what? All the embellishments of what happens after the movie without being crude. And it doesn't necessarily mean the bedroom either. Going to a dinner, taking a walk and, and saying that was a great movie. I love having time with you. All those things are positive things that you're remembering. When you break up with people, as painful as it is to think about the things that caused that breakup, when you're not with them, and they come to mind, what do you think of? I miss them when I used to do this with them. And you miss that, you ache, because you made what? A positive memory about that moment with that person. And when every time you think about that song when it comes on, that's why it hurts, because you can't plug into that good feeling anymore. You've been cut off. So you don't ever wanna invite that shit in your journaling. Journaling is always positive. You never, ever, ever say anything negative in your journaling, ever. Even if you did something wrong, you say, okay, this was an amazing opportunity for me to get the insights for when the market does this. You see what I just did there? I discharged and disarmed any possible chance for me to look at that losing trade or an idea that I thought would have panned out in the marketplace that was a perfect example, CPI. You saw two instances where I co-signed. I didn't have to do it, but I wanted to prove to you this is what I would expect right now, and it didn't do it. It just went right up the other way or other way, you know, going down. There was another time earlier in the summer where I did it where Kayla was right next to me and literally, literally was like, wow, that was so quick. But that same instance, I was right about it, but I wouldn't touch it. So... That speed of movement and price action on those types of events, if you're wrong, the way you disarm that is say, okay, this is why we don't trade ahead of the CPI number because it's too violent, it's too one-sided, and it's unforgiving. You can't trade your way out of it. You can't fix it. When the damage is done, it's like a neutron bomb, just boom, it's gone. All living organisms are evaporated. <laughs> Everything else looks the same except for any living organism is gone. So. You don't want to you don't want to vanquish your your trading career on one trading event like a CPI number. And you don't also want to stifle your development by recording highly emotional negativity in your journal entries. And it's easy to do. You feel like you want to do it. Don't. Don't go on social media and complain either. Oh, stupid so and so. Or I made a stupid mistake. I fucked up doing this, doing that. When you do that, you release it and it comes out of you. You think you let go of it, but your subconscious has got a, a lifeline to that, and it's anchored to your subconscious, and you will not cut it off. 
And the next time you get in the marketplace, what's going to happen is, all right, I'm getting in a trade. Oh, shit. You know, this feels like that last time it did this and this and this. And I, you know, took a bigger hit than I was supposed to. I'm scared. Now you're worried about having a repeat of that same toxic event that's normal with trading. You're going to have a losing trade. You're going to do something wrong. That's normal. Okay. Every one of us is doing it wrong. Okay. Every single one of us is going to have that. It doesn't mean you can't trade. It doesn't mean you're not profitable. It doesn't mean you have a good system or not a good system. It just means that you're human. But when you get in that trade and now you're starting to think about that other time when that, when I was at band camp and you know what I mean? That whole bad experience. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody that went to band camp, but no, I didn't go to band camp. <laughs> but the, if you look at the, the logic of referring back to another trade, while you're in that trade, are you managing that trade? No. You're managing fear about another trade that you can't make more on or lose more on. So your mind's divided. So the way you avoid all that shit is not to give it any energy in your journal. You take every experience, positive or negative, profitable or negative, a loss, and you make it an instructive, positive installment in your development. When does your development stop? When you're dead. I'm improving myself day by day, week by week. I'm a better mentor today than I was when I first started teaching as a young man before I should have been teaching. I'm not the best. In fact, I know I'm not the best mentor. I'm not. Uh, my trading is the best and my ability to read prices is the best, but I'm not the best teacher. I, I wish I was better than I am and I'm trying to be better than I am, but you know, I guess it's, we'll find out if it's is an improvement in 2023 or not but that five handles is plenty and you can split it up and and make your whole 25 handle career on multiple trades or one individual trade in the morning that gets five handles and you're done for the whole day that releases you from all of the expectations of being in the front of these charts longer than it's necessary which is good you want to limit that so if you get your trade with five handles when you're first starting out Turn the charts off. Look at everything afterwards in hindsight. Don't be lured into doing more because something moves around quick. You don't want to add to what's already been given to you, and that's your goal. Stop. That's what profitable trading is, having a goal, a business model. Okay, We call it a trading model, but it's a business model. You know, Foot Locker don't go out there and say, you know what? We're doing so well selling shoes. We need to get into the fucking pizza business. Let's start selling pizzas and burritos. Yeah, because who wouldn't want a fucking Foot Locker burrito, right? That shit don't work, okay? You're not going to upset the model that works for them, okay? And vice versa. You have a model. You sit down. You've done all the work. You built yourself up. You're learning this, and now you settled in. You're going to look for five handles in the E-mini S&P or the NASDAQ, one or the other. I'm preferring ES, and I think you should do that too. If you want to go into NQ later on when you have more you know, ability, that's fine. But it, when it moves fast, it can be wild and it can hurt you. It's a little bit more chaotic, so just be mindful of that. Don't be afraid of it, but in the beginning, respect it because if you don't know what you're doing, it can sting you. But you want to have that, that business model of knowing when are you going to stop. See, when I go into live streamers all the time, I'll ask them, I'll say, hey, let's I asked this of uh, Trades by Matt. I asked it by Corbs. I asked it by two other YouTubers, and they ignored me in there because I know why. <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to talk to me because they think I'm in there you know, trying to make fun of them. I'm not. I, I respect anybody that's doing a live stream. You know, I, I would never go in there and try to be disruptive about anything like that because number one, it takes a lot of focus and it's a dick move, and two, I can I can respect the fact that they're doing it because there isn't a lot of people that are willing to get out there and literally live stream. So that's that is ballsy in anybody that does it yeah that's that they got my respect even if they blow up all the time and you know blow their accounts and go to maximum loss multiple times in the same week it's still respectful that they do it i want to ask them questions like hey you know when do you stop what draws the line in the sand say okay i'm not trading anymore today i've done enough either because of the loss or the win like, how how do you get to the point of contentment where you no longer feel that it's 
needed for you to be in from the charts? Have you even considered that in your development, in your in your building of your trading plan? Because it's easy to see, oh, it's early. I've already got my 10 handles for today. That's two days of work. That's two days of work. What do you think? You're going to go in there again? Because that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to think the market's on fire. You got to push your edge until it's dull and you lost what you made and more. Plus commissions. Don't you feel smart? Twitter can get you hurt by people that don't want the fuck they're talking about. Your business model is only profitable when you follow it. Your trading plan is only profitable when you follow it. Your wife, your husband, your significant other, your children, your dependents, your best friends, your coworkers, your boss, and ICT, we're not going to be there to help you press the button and manage it and tell you when to stop. That's personal responsibility. And all of that rests on your shoulders. And if you're not in tune with the things that will lure you into dumb shit, gambling, going in there one more time, you got a good day. You made $1,000. You didn't try to make $1,000. It just, just happened, fell right in your hands. Don't look at that as, oh, shit, I'm way better than I thought I was. Fuck, I've been thinking about this all this time, thinking I wasn't that great. Look how good I am. I'm going to go out there and do this five more times because, shit, that's $6,000. Who doesn't want a $6,000 day? And then all of a sudden, you're looking at your account. It's gone. I've done that. <laughs> I've done it. I've done that. Okay, so you have to know when you're going to pull the plug. And we're going to talk about that real time in 2023. What changes the, the, the landscape, if you will, of the chart that says, you know what? It might move a little bit more, but I'm not interested anymore. I'm done. And that's going to piss people off. I'm like, well, why do you? And then you'll see them. They'll come in afterwards. Oh, but look at this move here that you didn't take. And I took this trade. Good for you. Well done. Good for you. I'm not going to shoot that down. But don't come at me because you found something that outside what I'm willing to take a trade on. That doesn't mean shit. It just means that you found a setup and you engaged it. Well done. That's exactly what traders are supposed to do. Find an independent setup that they took on their self. And they manage the risk. And if it was profitable, great. The point is I'm teaching people that don't know what the fuck they're doing. How do you go into this and do it right? How do you avoid all the likely pitfalls and snares that always trip up the neophyte new, new startups? See, you don't even know what you're likely to fall in, a victim to because you're too new. You have no idea how you're going to hurt yourself because you've never done it before. You got to learn from somebody that's done those things to themselves and learn from them. Not, yeah, just learn how to trade. I'm funded. Let me show you how to do it. Fuck that. No way. No, 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 no way. Uh -uh. I don't want a new surgeon cutting on me. Okay. Yeah, this guy's great. He was the, uh, he was the highest in our, in our class, the graduating class. He's got, he got the highest grades. This is his first operation. The fuck it is. Not with me, it ain't. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm out of there. See you later. Give me some old guy, okay, or old lady that's been doing it for a long time. I don't give a shit, okay? She can, they can shake their hands a little bit even, okay? I'd rather have that and, instead of the person that just came out of school. No, thank you. You don't, you don't have it yet. I, I'm not letting you cut me up. So you, when you're listening to someone that's teaching you, you don't want new experience teaching you. New experience is something to observe. You can appreciate it from afar where it can't hurt you, but you do not allow that to control any of your finances or the decisions thereof, okay? Because as good as any, anyone might be, because when I first came out, you know, once I hit the ground running and, and got over the initial shock and awe of not knowing what the hell I was doing, I got a good lick in the marketplace. And outwardly looking in, you would have thought I had everything figured out. And to be honest with you, I thought I did too, because the market just kept going up. And as a 20 year old, man, that's the worst thing that can ever happen is because now you think you, you figured it out. Let me be honest with you. I hate, I loathe, I can't fucking stand when people call me the goat or the, the king. Okay. And please don't ever refer to me as a GOD. I'm not, 
and it pisses me off. If I see it, I'm going to delete you and ban your account. Okay. I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's cute. It pisses me the fuck off. So why, why do I have this disdain for that? Number one, everybody else wants to be called that and undeservingly. I believed I was when I was 20. I believed I was. And in nine months of luck, gone instantly reality check you know and 1993 was uh, ugh, that that year you know it sucked in a lot of ways because it bursted a bubble in me that i thought was ballooning up and the reality of and weight of everything came crashing down on me when i realized that i could not trade as well as i thought i could have and I struggled with my online persona because, you know, here I was, you know, I'm inner circle trader in the making, but then I was Ox, O-X. Okay, that's, that was my moniker on, uh, on America Online. And as a young man with a chip on his shoulder that neither one of my parents were able to show an interest in me, I felt like I had to prove constantly prove 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 and I'm not, a lot of you get pissed off like dude why you keep trying to prove 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 listen as much as you might be meaning to be nice about that and some of you also are being dicks about it because like dude we get it you're not going to fix me okay so stop trying to mother me don't tell me that you know, stop trying to prove okay because i'm going to tell you fuck you okay because it's built into me it's a scar i can't fix it i know i'm never going to you know satisfy it but i can't stop being this way because it's an obsessive it's obsessive and i wrestle with it see the people that casually come into my twitter and they see this kind of stuff or their behavior they listen to these tweets or not tweets but these twitter spaces and they want to do a psychological evaluation on me okay fuck your psychological evaluation okay i don't give a fuck about your assessment on me okay you're not going to fix me you're not going to change me and i don't give a fuck if you unfollow i don't care i'm here to share what i know if you don't like what the fuck i'm saying get up the fucking road i'm not charging you but don't try to give me your psycho evaluation babble bullshit because none of that's going to do anything except for piss me off. And then I'm going to, you know, cut you off and, and I take an opportunity for you to become better at something and I'd remove it from you. Now, you could start another account. That's fine. But what generally happens is they get pissed off saying this guy's an asshole, an arrogant piece of shit. I don't give a fuck about him. And, and then they join the bandwagon of other people and other channels and they say, yeah, he's an asshole. Okay, whatever. You, I'm still sleeping this way, and you ain't changing it. But when I was 20, I felt like I was the greatest of all time, the GOAT. <laughs> it was stupidity. It's dumb. There is no fucking GOAT in trading, okay? There is no GOAT. There is no kings. Everybody in here makes and loses money, but nobody is as precise as me, and that does not make me the greatest of all time. It just makes me blessed. I know where it came from. I know whose hand it is, and I don't deserve it. So we'll we'll leave it at that and not turn it into a Bible study. But when you go beyond the scope of a five-handle model and you open yourself up to letting the trades run, what you'll find is you'll take half off at five handles and let it run to a higher time frame objective. And what would that be like? Well, yesterday. Because I knew the detractors out there that would take what I say and say, okay, five handles, five handles. You know, that's all you can do. I'm trading hundreds of handles. My examples are hundreds of handles. Okay, so that's 400 ticks. Not 20 and 30 ticks and calling it superiority. It's not. It's a growth period that you're going to have to go through. Nobody's going to walk out there watching a YouTube video from ICT or anybody else and know how to consistently find 100 plus handle moves in. The indices. You, you're, you're not. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to be scared, and that's normal. And you see a lot of educators, because I know I see them. Uh, they talk a lot, a big game about knowing this and knowing that, and they can do this, and they can do that. But when you watch them do the live streams, their stop placements are all erratic if they use any of them, and many times their stop is opening themselves up to bigger risk, and they're trying to get like two handles or three handles. To me, that communicates what? They have no idea what the fuck they're doing. 
So they have no business teaching anyone. So the logic is flawed, it's lacking. So you have to choose your source very carefully. If they can't, if they can't collectively bring together a logic and only frame the trade ideas in that logic and use a stop loss and manage a stop loss the same way each and every time, then they don't know how to do what? Follow a model. They're not disciplined and they're not aiming for something. Like, look at the examples I'm showing you. Four to one, 10 to one, 12 to one. You can afford to get those losing trades when you're aiming for things like that. But you can't go out there looking for those setups right away because you have to grow into your understanding about what it is the markets are doing. How do you know that the, the fair value gap wasn't going to close ICT? The fact that when you're looking for the 3864 level, I prompted you on in the morning session yesterday. We had already drove deep from the opening at 9.30. It ran up, returned to the top of the fair value gap, premium high. And you'll know what I mean by looking at your charts if you draw them up like I showed you in the Twitter thread from yesterday's morning session. And then it went down and dove down, made a low of the morning. Remember, it's gonna be an inside day. Was the Thursday low likely to be taken out? No. Why? It's the last trading day of the year. No new money's gonna be pushing anything. And the market's already been going down. So no new shorts are entering. So it's setting up the likelihood of what? A PM session reversal and short covering. And the algorithm will reprice aggressively, causing more what? More short covering. Everything I outlined and typed out in that trading view text. So what's it gonna aim for? The level I showed you in the chart, I put a little trend line on. I said, make your chart look like this. Go back and look at the tweet. I can't delete it. I can't edit it. I can't do anything. Tens of thousands of people watched it happen right when I did it. More later on in the day. Extend that line out in time. It's a three o'clock hour. Where does it go? Right where I said it was going to fucking go. 3864 buy side liquidity. When do you expect it to set up, Michael? The last hour of trading, PM session. Why? That last hour. The algorithm is going to run a series of macros. Macros are a short list of commands and orders that it produces fluctuations in price. Market on close orders are going to be a major driver, and one of those macros are just that. It's the last 20 to 25 minutes, specifically 15 minutes, that it'll kick in. And it's going to run for a pool of liquidity above or below the marketplace. All you have to do is do the work in figuring out why it should go to one or the other based on narrative. Narrative is what I outlined yesterday. The fact that it was going to be an inside day before it was an inside day, before the market even opened up. Knowing that when I left you in the morning session, I said, note the relative equal highs on your hourly chart. 38.64. Because somebody asked later on, did you mean this? And I corrected everybody by putting it right on the same tweet when I said, note those relative equal highs on your 60-minute chart. In that tweet, I replied to my own tweet and said, 3864 dot, dot, dot. That way there was no miscommunication whatsoever. Even though you had it drawn out in your chart in the morning session before the market even started trading. So... All those levels and those fair value gaps extend them through into the three o'clock to four o'clock hour because the algorithm is doing the same thing. It's referring back to those levels, not your old lows and your old highs and classic support and resistance and bullshit trend lines. That does not work. Okay. You're not going to be able to hold a trade with a one tick stop with a diagonal trend line. You will never see Forex trade like that. Where you can hold up stop like that that's why i laugh at all these young guys out there saying i always use a one pip stop loss i can do it i can do it you can do it on a fucking demo yeah you can do that but do it with size in a real count and i guarantee you consistently you'll never do it but in futures that is possible because these markets are much more refined there isn't all of these different servers everybody has the same high and low 
So, and then some of you are thinking, well, why the hell did you ever stop leaving? Why'd you leave that to go to Forex? Because Forex was moving around a lot and that volatility really like, man, I'm going over there. I, I, Cause I cannot, I can cowboy up in that. But futures has always been highly precise. Way and probably now you just dis discovered how much precision really it, you know, exists in it. And even I have people that used to trade on the floor at the CME and the COB, uh, CBOT. They're students here. And they have communicated that they have no idea how the fuck I'm doing this. Now, these are the four boys. These were the guys. These were the kings of the pit. And you don't think that that type of remark doesn't resonate with me? I know. I know that they have feel, they, they feel like they have hit the lottery here. Because they have real world experience trading down in there in all the fucking chaos, all the fucking chaos, screaming and hollering, big days, shitty days, big up days, big down days, crashes. They were in there. They were dealing with it, literally. And that transition from open outcry in the pits to go into electronic and they got to now use a fucking chart. A lot of them couldn't do it. In fact, I got one floor trader that said, I could not make money when we come off the floor. And now I'm able to do it now because of what you're teaching. It makes so much fucking sense. Yeah. These are the floor fucking traders, okay? You know, they do the pivot numbers and stuff. And that was their, that was their numbers. And then they watched everything else around the volume flow that would come in. No charts in their hands. They're working with the number. I came out of that era with them. I wasn't on the floor with them, but I was open outcry. That's the way things worked. Everything was slow. Now it's a push of the button, instant gratification, instant fill, instant confirmation. Everything's instantaneous. We didn't have that shit, man. You had to call up and wait. And sometimes if you got a busy fucking signal, you're flipping the fuck out because the market's running to your stop and you want to get the hell out of it. Or you're stupid like I was a couple of times and didn't have a fucking stop. And I'm like, fuck, I'm going to get my ass handed to me. And they won't answer the fucking phone. <laughs> what the fuck's going on here? Or I called, I'm flipping out and they say, okay, uh, you know, uh, Lynn Maldock, you know, I can take your call. H desk. Okay, one second. H desk, how can I help you? Uh, account number, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what's your pin? And you give them the wrong pin. It's not the right pin, right? No, it's not the right pin. And you're giving them the fucking price you're trying to get out at in soybeans. <laughs> yeah, that's how fucking manic it can be. Like, it's crazy. Like, and the whole time, the market's not waiting for you. It's not waiting for you. It's moving. It's moving. And then you got to wait for them to confirm what you just told them because they got to repeat it because everything's being recorded. And then once you say, yes, that's correct, they say, you want to hold for your confirmation? Yes. Okay. The net sound of silence. And I'm looking at my quote track and I'm watching the fucking price. Just keep on steamrolling towards where it's painville for me. That, that is the longest time interval that you're ever going to experience. And you don't have that now. You never experienced that, you young folks. You have no idea what that was like. None of you do. If you're if you're less than honestly, if you're less than I don't know, maybe 40, 43, 44. You don't know what that feels like. Because you probably came up in the beginnings of electronic trading and the way of the dinosaur open outcry and things like that, that, that was falling away fast. But the reason why that fair value gap stayed open, I want you to think about, you're into uh, the race car, you know, these uh, funny cars, they're real long, skinny nose cars, and they race them real quick. The lights, they, they go from like uh, yellow, yellow, yellow. I mean, I don't know if that's the right color, but then they go to green and they take off and they start running real quick. And they have to use parachutes in the back to stop them. Okay. Think about a market like that. Okay. Think about what I've outlined yesterday on the morning session. And I left you with 3864. That was, make sure you note that because that's where the market's going to go. We go into the last part of the day, PM session. And if you did what I told you to do, make your charts look like what I had on mine and extend them like I teach you in mentorship. Extend them through. We are not supply and demand. Okay. We're not online trading academy. We're not Sam Sidon. We don't have an issue with cutting through candles because the algorithm looks through candles. Sorry. 
That's just the way it is. So when you have an inefficiency, just because it closes that inefficiency in, that's not balance. It's not a balanced void, okay? It's just repriced to the inefficiency. Those levels of the high and low that makes that inefficiency will still be referred to by the algorithm. You see proof of it just by extending it through into the last hour of trading. Now, at 311 to 312 to 313 New York local time, which would be 511, 512, and 513 on New York time on TradingView's chart, one minute, there is a fair value gap there. And you see me drawing that in the little light blue. I took all the other fair value gaps because it would have been too much because I know I was going to put a, a watermark on it because I know any type of trade like that, everybody's going to put that on their Instagram and say, join my signal service. Look, I can do that. They're fucking assholes. So I, I hate the fact that I got to do this because I, I don't like seeing it clutter up the chart. But if I don't do it, everybody takes my shit and pretends it's theirs because nobody's pushing buttons and having this much precision. So if you take that one minute fair value gap, Notice how it just bangs the bottom of it. It does not need to come outside of that one minute fair value gap because we've already touched the low end of the 15 and the 60 minute fair value gap. Once, you're probably saying, what the hell does that have to do with the funny cars and the racing, right? <laughs> if you know the market's likely to go 3864, and you know that the likelihood is everybody's going to be squeezed out of their short positions because the algorithm is going to start repricing higher, 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 spooling towards those buy sell liquidity pools that I've outlined on the chart at 54, if my memory starts incorrect, and then up at 64. Okay, so the initial buy sell liquidity, that was the, the, the first draw. And what I'm waiting for is I want to see speed. And you'll see me say in there, I type it out and say, okay, you're going to start seeing large range candles and the speed, study the speed. You're going to hear me talk about this in the live streams. You're looking for that. That is a signature. What does that mean? It's something that you should be seeing in price. If it's not doing that, you're probably offside or it's going to consolidate longer. And depending upon the time of day, if you're going into lunch, you want to cut, cut bait, don't trade. But ICT, we watched you trade in New York. That's me. I'm trading outside of what I've already been willing to share to you. I have other tricks and shit. I got all kinds of stuff. I got weapons you ain't never seen before, and I'm not going to share them all. I'm sorry. You can't have all my tech. I'm sorry. It's not You're not entitled to it. I'm not teaching everything I know. But what I am teaching, what I've already taught, is plenty. So if you're expecting speed in the direction of that 3864 level, what would you want to see? A real quick sudden move up, just like that, right? Now, for the gentlemen out here to have, and maybe some of you ladies too that are hot riders, if you have a, a fast car, and maybe you just got your license recently and you took your dad's car out and <laughs> you want to burn some rubber, knowing damn well you shouldn't be doing it. But when you sit there and you neutral drop your car, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but some people do it, you burn out and you make a skid mark as the car takes off real quick, okay? You want to see that in price, that burnout, that sudden run. Pro Charge Mopar notes exactly what I'm talking about right now. He's already smiling because he's now getting it. That, that runaway real quick move, when you're expecting speed to come into the marketplace, that displacement, you want to see it stay open. You do not want to see it come back down in. When you see that, that is a breakaway gap. When we had markets that were not 24 hours, okay, like Forex is 24 hours, and stock indices are not 24 hours, but there's a small window of time where one hour it's not trading, but you have a gap opening. That gap opening sometimes is useful, but when we didn't have electronic trading, there was always gap openings. You had overnight gap risk is what it was. Gap risk is always an issue. You didn't know where your currency futures were going to open up. You didn't know, you know where this shit was going to open up unless you were monitoring overnight you know, on the Globex what was going on. And Globex is like the overnight session. So I'm trying to teach you to anticipate when you're expecting a market move to go a one direction, higher or lower, based on your bias. 
the narrative was I left you in the morning session, 3864, note that relatively equal high because you know that's where we're heading. Three o'clock hour starts. We are finding real support at fair value gap discount lows. And we create a fair value gap on the one minute chart. 11 minutes, 12 minutes, and 13 minutes, respectively on a one minute chart on ES. That fair value gap is drawn out for you in the recording. It's a little light blue one. I move my stop up just below the low of the 311 to 313 fair value gap. I'm just below that, one tick. And the whole time I'm recording this, I'm thinking to myself, they're going to shit themselves when they see this. And to prove it, I went in and I bought it again when it went down and touched the bottom of the fair value gap. Why didn't it go outside of that? That's what you're wondering, right? Why didn't it go outside that? Because it had already tapped the low of the fair value gap on the hourly, the 15, and the five, uh, I'm sorry, the, the one minute fair value gap. It had already touched it twice perfectly. And we were running short on time. We were running down the clock until four o'clock. Yes, it trades a little bit past that. I, that's not my point. The, the volume that's going to come in on market on close orders is 3.40 to 4 o'clock. That little window right there, okay? Days that close with liquidity pools that have not been breached or engaged yet, you'll find that that little segment of time is a sweet spot for a model all in its, of itself. Who wouldn't want 20 handles? I pulled it out like it was nothing yesterday. 22 handles for the people that made fun of just five handles. It's 87 ticks per contract. So how do I know it's going to stay open? Just like a burnout. Okay, think about that funny car, that, that stock car that's real fast. And when that green light go, it takes off. It's gone up the road. It's gone. You don't want to see it go back to the starting line. You don't want to see it do that. You want to see it what? Just keep on hauling ass. So when you're expecting price to deliver and run towards a goal and you have a limited time, what would that look like? Well, if you're trading in the 10 o'clock hour, 10 o'clock to 10.30. Remember, 11 to, to noon is when things start creating the consolidation for lunch. Not that it will, but my expectation is if things start to slow down going into lunch. And then lunch usually has a retracement, goes for the liquidity you know, during that hour or prior to it. And then it's either going to continue or reverse or stay consolidation. And that's a discussion entirely for 2023 because we will talk about that. But when I look at the market and I'm expecting – uh, fair value gap to stay open, I'm anticipating more volatility and velocity in the direction of that run. And see, the, the things that I saw with Chris Laurie's stuff, he never had that, never talked about that. Nobody else has ever talked about it either. I wish there was other books or authors and things that would talk about these things because I could save myself a lot of aggravation because I know it's going to take lecture and lecture and lecture doing this and also show it to you live. I have no problem doing that. But most of you that keep asking the same questions, even when I give you what I believe is the, the best I can articulate, it's frustrating for me because you're, you're not going to connect with it because you haven't done other things. And for folks that have been with me for a while, the analogy of a burnout, okay, when the car you know, takes off and you know, skids its wheels as it's going real fast forward, that run up that creates that big candle one way, that's like that. Like that, it's a car. It's just finally been allowed to go quick, and it peels off real quick. Those instances when you're expecting the market to run hard, you want to see that stay open. Now, the question is going to be: Is okay? Well, XCT, have you ever had that instance where you felt it was likely to do that, and it went back into it? Yes. If it does, I'm going to buy it. In fact, if you watch the video, I'm waiting because there was one time where I thought it was going to dip in there, and then that would have been institutional order flow entry drill. It doesn't change the bias. It doesn't change the fact that it's not going to go higher. It's going to go higher. It's just giving me an opportunity to buy it at a slightly lower discount. 
But in my logic is it will stay open. It will not completely close. It might go down just below the top of the fair value gap. That's institutional order flow, entry drill. It's a technique for high frequency trading. Algorithms use that as a entry model. Boom, 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 firing in there real quick. That's the other algorithm. The, the algorithm that is the price engine that makes price go where it's going to go and no buying and selling pressures doing anything about it, nothing. How much, how many contracts cause the S&P to move five handles? How many contracts does it take to do that? <laughs> Think about that logic for a second. How many contracts, how much volume does it take to move the S&P five handles? Oh, shit. Never thought about things like that, did you? But the books don't talk about it either, so it's never come up in, in question, right? You only need one contract to book price. One contract, one contract, one contract. It does not matter. That's why when you see charts that used to track volume when we were a uh, futures trader, market keeps going up. The volume bars keep going down. What the hell's going on? Volume ain't it, folks. That's not how you use volume. That's not how you use volume. You use volume in the sense that, hey, order flow is going to increase the velocity of orders coming in and traders wanting to do something. You can time that. You can time it. Certain times of the day, it's like, well, you know, at the opening, there's a lot of volatility, right? And that last 20-minute period of the last hour trading, you can plan on it again. So if you have untapped liquidity pools that are just so obvious you're sitting right there, you know, that last 20 minutes of trading, that's how you do it. You aim for that. Now, what happens if you get it wrong if it doesn't move in your favor and stops you out or doesn't move? That's trading, folks. That's just the way it is. You have to have a catalyst for why you're going to go into the marketplace and do whatever it is you're trying to do. If you're going to be a buyer, what makes that or constitutes a reason for you to be a buyer? There has to be some kind of logic that you're following behind you, you're exercising and inviting risk. You can't just well, I feel like doing something because I got time. There has to be a logic as to why you're expecting it to do it. So in short answer, when I'm anticipating gaps to stay open, I have already framed out the logic that it should be a market that should be moving quick. And if I see that, then I know I can do what? I can trust that my liquidity or inefficiency I'm aiming for will be traded to. That's why you see the confidence in my texts that people think it's cherry picked or that I'm adding it after the video has been done. There's no way you can explain all that shit. Okay. It's being typed through TradingView real time. And when I type this stuff, if it was something added on after the fact, like a, like a, because I can take annotations and type it into a video on Camtasia. But when I add it to that, like, for instance, look at my watermark, innercircletrader.com. Okay. That stays in one place. That's how you know it's Camtasia. That's added after the fact. That's an after recording annotation. In TradingView, do this and test it for yourself on Tuesday when the markets are open again. Go in there and type out something with TradingView on a one-minute chart and then watch it. The annotations tick to the left when there's a new candle opening up. You're telling me that I have that much editing ability that I can go in there and I can fucking make 20 different things on my annotations all move in synchronicity. The fuck out of here, man. And you're giving me way too much fucking credit for shit that ain't impossible. Just accept the fact that I can do this and you're going to see me do it anyway. You're going to be able to learn how to do this. Okay. Stop making excuses for holding on to dumb shit that doesn't work well for you. Okay. Or maybe you're struggling or you got to worship your hero or he's going to kick you out of your service or whatever. Fuck it. Get, get away from those type of people. If somebody's telling you, you better rep me in my community, or you're getting kicked out of here, get the fuck away from that person. That's not a mentor. That's a nut job, okay? You don't have to pay anything to be here. I have people in my mentorship that don't like my personality. I'm not kicking them out. They don't have to like me. I don't give a shit. You don't have to like me. I'm not here for friends. I'm not here for friends. I'm not inviting any of you over to my house. I'm not going to have dinner with you. OK, I know that shit's going to happen, but I love turning average people into dynamos. I've done it before, and in 2023, I'm going to do a whole lot more of it. All these things, all these things repeat in the marketplace. 
They repeat at specific times under specific conditions and circumstances. The job that you have is understanding which one of these things resonates with you. Some of you might look at the opening at one at 9.30 in the morning when equities open up, you know, when the bell the stock market, ding, 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 opens. That volatility might scare you, it might be real terrifying for some of you. And I get it, that's fine. It's kind of like London Open on a high, high impact news driver on Forex, you know, it's scary. How do you sell short knowing, how do you know when it's gonna go? You put a stop loss in the event that you're wrong. You have to trust the logic that you're working with. See, when you read folks there sending me tweets and you probably see it with other people too, um, they'll say, you know, how do you know to put uh, your stop loss there? How do you know when to buy that when it's going down? How do you how do you know it's not going to keep going lower? Well, if I knew for a surety that it wasn't likely to go beyond my actual entry point, I would never use a stop loss, would I? But because listen to this, folks, this is the this is the cream of the crop type of advice. This is a shit that you need to write down and make sure you understand it. I know the playbooks. I know the algorithm, I know the macros, I know what it's going to do, I know when it's likely to do it. But here's what happens sometimes. <laughs> I almost said his name. A particular person says, well, you know what? We want to put a little bit more oomph in this move. And or it would be more advantageous for us if it went well beyond the scope of the average daily range that everybody would expect in the opposite direction. And that's manual intervention. So when manual intervention occurs, it's much like CPI or FOMC. Shit just comes out of nowhere. You can get wrecked by it. And sometimes it just keeps on going and going and going. And you can physically be harmed beyond repair in those types of moves if you're trading size. So it's like the roulette table at the casino. Everybody thinks, well, you know, you can go over there and you can bet on red or you can bet on black. All you gotta do is pick red or black. Wrong, wrong, because there's a green. Green is the fuck you color, okay? You might have odds that red is gonna come up. You might have odds that black's gonna come up, but that table in that casino is rigged, just like the old riverboat casinos, okay? A lot of people don't know this, but those riverboat casinos, their roulette tables, they were they discovered underneath the wooden roulette wheel, there was these little metal paddles, okay? And the operator of the table would have a paddle for red, a paddle for green, and a paddle for black, okay? And people get in there and they bet their favorite number, their birthday, the, the day they got married, the day they had their kid, you know, whatever it is, they think that there's something special about it. There's a red 17, there's a black 17, whatever it is. They don't give a fuck about the number. They can't control the number. The number is not ever going to be controlled. That never, ever happens. The color is it. What happens is they say, okay, no more bets. And he weighs his hand out there. Why is he doing that? Because he needs time to get an assessment on where the money is mostly. Is it more on red, more on black? And if he can't decipher right away what it is, he's pushing the green paddle. What does that mean? Underneath the wooden wheel, underneath one, every single one of those little squares that's either colored 17 or 12 or whatever, it's, it's red or black or green comes up, okay? The, the casino's in business to take money in, but they have to pay out, but they have to do it on a ratio basis. So when the money is being brought in, there has to be the majority for them coming in and they pay out the minimum. Pay out minimum, intake is larger. Over the course of a day, a month, a year, they profit, and people still make money. So the theory is this. If you were going back in time and you were on this riverboat, you could sit there and watch the guy say, okay, no more bets. Look at the stacks of chips on what color. Fuck the numbers. The numbers are the red herring. That's the magician's misdirection. You watch the color. Wherever the bulk of that color is being bet on, that's the fucking color that's not coming up. Now, underneath the wheel, the paddles would come up with magnets. Inside that little white ball, that ball is a magnet. It's polarized. 
So if that ball is bouncing around like it does, it's only going to settle on a square that will allow it to fall in. Think about how magnets opposite attract, same repel. So if the operator doesn't want that ball to fall in a red, then it's going to be the same polarity as the ball. So when it falls in there, it'll fall and bounce out and then fall into the nearest black. Who gives a fuck what number it is? It's falling in black. So red loses. So the table collects the payout to them as income with all the bets on red. And black wins. Who gives a shit? The payout's larger for the table coming in on red than the payout on black. The black, yeah, we won. Everybody's like, fuck yeah, this guy's hot. I'm putting my money behind him. So now the table's going to watch everybody's bet based on this dude. And if he doesn't have enough time to assess how much money is in there, which is better, green's coming up, and they all lose. It's all rigged, folks. <laughs> it's all rigged, okay, and this is the way it is. So there's one armed bandits, those slot machines. I uh, couldn't for, remember what they were a couple spaces back. I, just, I, don't, I don't go to casinos, but they're the same way. They're only going to pay out once they take in so much money. That's it. That's why everybody goes around, they walk around the machines and they say, okay, I'm watching this person. He's been here for four hours. Okay, it ain't hit for a while. If they get up, I'm getting on that machine. Not because you are lucky. They know what? It's going to pay out. It's due to pay out. Now, take that same logic and apply it to time of day, day of week, report days, medium impact, high impact, liquidity. It all makes sense. There's controllers in everything that we do. You go to work, you got a boss. You gonna put your money in the marketplace? There's a boss. That boss has a job. Manipulate the money from your hands into theirs. Oh, now you're going back on saying uh, the brokers are trading against the, the client. <laughs> I'm not even talking about the broker. I'm talking about an entirely different entity way above them. That's that collective entity that is smart money. That's who's working in all these things. This opportunity, this, this whole facade, thinking that you have a free and random market when that is not the case at all. How the fuck can I do what I'm doing if it's random? How can it be that precise if it's random? Hmm? If there's no algorithm, how can I display, teach, and repeat over and over and over again? Here's my challenge to the naysayers. I want you to outline a market like I did on Friday. One-sided, very specific level, and then record precision entries. Mark up the annotations, everything. Record it. I don't need you to do it live. Record it through TradingView because I know it can't happen through market replay. And then you post that and say, this is how ICT is doing it. It's cherry picked. You can't. Because if you're managing a one-minute chart, how many one-minute charts can you – can you manage another one-minute chart going the opposite direction when you're managing that one-minute chart, annotating it constantly, moving everything? Look, man, that's some bullshit, okay? That's some bullshit. And takeaway is this. It was already talked about hours before in the morning session. There's no way you can argue against it. And I can do it live in any setting. Hello. So there probably isn't going to ever be another mentor like me. I'm a little unstable and probably lunatic fringe in most of your minds, and that's fine. <laughs> that, that gets me. Uh, it makes me a little more interesting than the average person. But I use that like a carnival barker, just like I use the demo, the demo baller. Oh, let's just see this clown. What the hell? This guy keeps calling it right. Yeah. Yep. And I'm hiding in plain sight. Who's going to take a demo baller serious? Nobody. But anybody that's ever came to my mentorship, they only saw demo trades. They only saw me executing just like this shit all the time. There was no any other imitation except for seeing what you've been watching me do. And now you're all going to get a taste of learning just how to do it for free and real time.
It's exciting, isn't it? If you're not excited, if you're not at all amped up about, you know, broadening your understanding about price action, man, I don't know what to tell you because it's going to be fun. It's going to be real fun. I'm trying to make sure I covered all of my faces here, and I think I have. So in uh, 2023, outside of, I guess, the stuff I'm going to be droning on in live streams, the uh, the invitation for you to be part of my personal life. A lot of uh, a lot of you asked for me to do a little bit more of that. I guess I can, you know, do a little bit more. Um, I'm probably going to be recording a video today, putting it up there on YouTube just to show you the mobile command center, the ICT uh, mobile command center. We have a Class A RV. That uh, you've probably heard me. Sometimes the audio doesn't sound great. You got to get yourself a new mic. You are listening to me in an RV. Okay, that's that, that the acoustics in the RV is is not the same as being in a room that has, you know, better acoustics. But uh, I'm going to be traveling a lot this year, and I'm probably going to be coming down to your neck of the woods. And I'd be interested to uh, do like meet and greets, you know, in in different states and such. Um, I have to figure out how I'm going to do that because my wife and my two dogs will be with me. So I, I obviously you can't come on board with us because my dogs would probably want to cheer your ass up. My wife probably wouldn't feel comfortable with that. But it's something I want to entertain. Uh, we want to see more of the country and uh, get out there and, and use this thing. And the fact that I'll be doing a uh, video or two a week from it will allow me to depreciate it. Also, so three hundred thousand dollars gets wrote off over the course of seven years. So that's how you do things. <laughs> no lease required, but it's a mobile home basically. I mean, it's it's got four leather massaging heated recliners. It's got a fireplace, flat screen TVs. One, two, three of them. One on the outside, one in the living room area, and one in the master bedroom. Um, it's got a crow's nest. Uh, above the driver's area and the dinette turns into a, a sleeping area. It's got a shower. It's got washer and dryer. It's it's, it's really nice. It's really, really nice. And we, we went out with it a few times uh, this year. And there's a couple states that I want to go to Utah. I want to go to Wyoming. And I want to go to uh, Montana. Those are some of the, and you, maybe, maybe some of those states you're not in or whatever. Uh, they're the main ones I want to go to. They're just beautiful out there. And Montana is another state that I'm thinking about getting property in. So there's a really, really bigger than the house I have now. Um, I, I'm really wanting to go see it. The, the seller is holding it like he's not putting it on the market for me or anyone else to buy right now because he knows I'm I'm planning a trip in, in the springtime. But if I like it, you will see it. <laughs> Trust me, you will see it. it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Three times actually bigger than this one here. And it's just beautiful. It's got a grotto and a huge, huge hardscaping and just it's got tennis court, basketball court. It's got a go-kart track on it. It's just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Big old view of just loveliness all around it. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to in spring. So I'm not a person that likes to fly. Uh, I don't want to be in the air. So. RV does it for us. It allows us to go around and, and travel and the old fuddy duddy ICTs, uh, motor scooter around in a class A RV. So, but anyway, when I, when I post that video, just know that it's not because I'm, I'm bragging. I have to make sure that everyone knows that it's anchored to the channel and then the digital nomad will be a playlist that will allow me to legally depreciate the, uh, the $300,000 motorhome. So that's how you do things through the scope of depreciation and paying for things. Basically, you know, it's not, I didn't get it for free, obviously, but uh, you pay for it and then you can write it off over the course of, of the years and you make money, you just write that down. So it allows me to uh, get better use of it instead of just buying it like anyone else. If you, when you buy your car, it's it, you're done. But when I buy a car and I show it, 
Yeah, and I own all my cars. Okay. And don't listen to these fucking people out there saying I lease my vehicles. I showed you lease vehicles, but I own all my cars. I own all of them. I have a car net with my son so he can get his credit, but we're about to pay that off. But uh, you have to depreciate the vehicle then. And you get your accountant to help you with that shit. But uh, you can make big purchases, but you have to have a real use for it. So if I just bought an RV and I don't use anything like a, um, like the YouTube channel, that venue allows me to say, okay, well, I'm running a corporation through YouTube. I get ad revenue. I get I get sponsors all the time. And I could probably do about $30,000 a month just in sponsors, but I turn all of them down. I don't want to be that kind of YouTuber. So if you've received denials from me <laughs> or ignoring your request, okay, it's not personal. I just don't want to do it because I don't, I don't want, I don't want that kind of stigma attached to you know, my YouTube channel. There's other people out there can do it. I'm sure I'll have students that'll be willing to do it for you and they can make money like that too. And I'm encouraging all of you to do it and you know, get good at what I'm teaching you. And there it is. And you, here's the thing, folks, you don't ever, you don't ever need to show a live account. You don't. Because if you can sit down live and call the market before it happens, sitting on TradingView, doing it live, because I got here at 426,000 almost subscribers on YouTube. I've never advertised. I never ran ads. And I just simply recorded myself doing trades with logic that I taught. And there it is. So don't listen to anybody tell you that you have to do that. Now, if you're going to do signal service, you better damn well have a track record. That's absolutely guaranteed that you need to have that. But if you're going to you know, run a service where you're going to you know, call the market live, I don't call that signal service, okay? But there's a lot of people out there. I have, I have people in my own mentorship that are asking, is there students in their user group that are doing signal services because they want to do it because they can't do it themselves. So think about it. There's always different walks of life. There's all different types of individuals that's in this industry that some of them just simply can't do it. No matter who trains them, how long they've been doing it, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Some people simply won't do it, but they can't let go of it. So they want to be a part of it the only way they can, which is by handholding with someone that can do it well. And listen, folks, you know, 15, 16, 18 thousand dollars a month, you know, ad revenue. I think anybody can live pretty comfortable in that. And you don't even need to do a live account ever. You're not obligated to do that because if you're out there explaining what your opinion is on the marketplace and it unfolds, just like you said, who's going to argue against that? People that are trying to sell something else. Fuck them. Okay. They're broke. They can't build their audience. And if you're wholesome and you're honest and you tell people exactly what's going to happen and it happens, your community will grow organically. And there's a lot of people that don't like me. And that's fine. I get it. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But you can't say my stuff don't work. Because that's bullshit. Because it works. It works in my hands. It works in everybody else's hands that puts the work into it. And you're all encouraged to do the same thing. There's nothing. I'm not going to try to shoot you down, talk bad about you. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people out there that are doing what I teach. I love it. I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed me to be impactful in that regard. I'm not running around saying, look at me. Everybody's trying to be like me. They're all trying to do their own thing. And I was just a catalyst, a conduit to help them get there. They give me a high five. Thank you. Appreciate everything you've done. Run, run, man. I want to see you do it. I, that's the whole reason why I did this. Think about it. When I stepped out on Baby Piss, if you knew me that, back then, it was a social experiment. I wanted to see who could do it and what they're going to do with it. How are they going to make an impact in the world? To me, you know, that's interesting. I mean, I have a very biased opinion about what it is I know and what I can do. But I also have limitations on what I'm allowed to do. And I'm not going to divulge any more than that. But if I can bring other people very, very close to what I can do, and I can live vicariously through them, that to me is like winning. because. Unfortunately, I have handlers and I can't do certain things. So I have to do within the scope of what I'm allowed to do. This is it. But I'm going to push that boundary as far as I can in 2023. And I'm going to try to bring as many of you up as I can. 
And the only thing I ask you to do is very, very diligently work within the scope of where I'm placing your attention and only there. And don't do anything more. Don't try to stretch beyond that because you have extra time or you feel like it's not enough. Don't. Don't dilute your focus from whatever it is I'm trying to bring your attention to. If you went and just looked at yesterday's price action and you tried to look for things that are taught on my YouTube channel outside the scope of what I was doing, you would be very frustrated, which is the reason why I walked everybody through the top down approach from the daily four hour, 60 minute, 15 minute, five minute chart. I gave you the very levels that I'm going to have on my chart and what I'm looking at. Those levels are going to be influential in what price is going to do. And what's it going to do? It's going to gyrate around inside of Thursday's range. It's not going to go above Thursday's high. It's not going to go below Thursday's low. And it's going to attack that 3864. And like gangbusters, delivered beautifully. And good old ICT was right there to scoop up on it. Recorded it, showed you the whole logic and how to trust. When you're in, I get this question all the time. How can you trust holding on to your trade? Well, apply what I just went through with Friday's trading. You know, 3864 was a hard level. That was something that I brought everyone's attention to. And it's drawn on the chart well before any real reference to it. It's there. Those are the levels. Anytime I have a level on my chart, we are extending them in time. Extend them in time. To when the next trading session, we, we were in, we were together in the morning, and then the afternoon is going to be trading. Right, we still had trading hours. I just said, close your charts, you know, enjoy the rest of the day, knowing damn well that most of you aren't going to do anything with what I've already said in the charts, and I'd come right back in and show you this is what you missed. Those levels, if you extend them into the three o'clock hour, you'll see that they're right there lining up as what you would expect real support to act as. So that was one of the problems I had as a developing student. You know, John Murphy's book, uh, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets, that is a retail trader's Bible. If you do not have that book, you need to get it and read it. And everything in that book, turn it upside down. And you will be a 90% bracket success story. It's just that simple. Everything in that book is horseshit. It's wonderful because it's programming everybody to do the dumbest shit in the world. Look at charts this way. And when you do, you shit yourself. Your account's blown. You have loss after loss after loss. It doesn't make any damn sense. And when I said to myself, I am not looking at this shit like this no more. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fade this. And what gave me the idea was you know, there's a pattern, called the head and shoulders pattern. You know, it's a topping formation. And I mean, when I was trying to learn how to be a short seller, and that was one of the things I was afraid of, I didn't understand how can you sell short something you don't have? How are you going to sell something you don't own? So it was a real struggling point for me, you know, because, you know, I, like I said, I'm not a mental giant, but the long and short of it is when I first started dabbling in it, the pattern that I was trusting to be the reason why I'm going to sell short was the hidden shoulders where you have a, a swing high, a higher swing high, and a lower swing high. And it's like three swing highs with one higher in the middle. And then there you connect the lows that run beneath the left shoulder and the right shoulder of that price action. And it should project lower the same amount or real close proximity to the range from the trend line connecting the two swing highs, lows to the highest high. And trust me, if you don't know what I'm talking about, because I'm just listening to myself now, it sounds like a bunch of shit. And it is. But if you go to Google and look up head and shoulders price pattern, you'll see what exactly what I'm talking about. Well, that was the pattern I was trying to train myself to trust as a short seller. Man, I got my ass handed to me over and over and over again. And when I look back at my journals, it's the times when I'm fucking trying to do like Friday PM session where I'm buying right there. I was looking at that as some kind of a, of, of a topping pattern. Not that that was a head and shoulders pattern, but I would have been looking at that as, okay, it's done. Now it should start going down. Why? I don't know. It just felt like I should expect it to go down there. And that's exactly how I trade as a 20 year old. It just, it probably should, probably should, probably should. That's not a, that's not a model. That's guessing. So <laughs> a lot of the shit that's in that book by John Murphy is 
wonderful when you know how to trade like I'm teaching you. If you see those retail patterns in the market, in the price action, while my logic that I'm teaching you and how the markets are algorithmic, if there's a wrestling match between what's in those fucking book pages and what I've taught on my YouTube channel, that book's losing. There's your inside edge right there. If you can combine the times when algorithmically the things I'm teaching are likely to pan out and you can see a retail fucking pattern that's in that book or any other YouTube channel that teaches that horse shit, that's losing and I'm winning. My logic is the market. That shit is just pictures and candlesticks and, and bars. That's it. Animal patterns don't fucking exist. That's all contrivance. It's, it's, it's all bullshit. You're making excuses for something that was completely in your favor, not because of logic. It just was happenstance. And that's why their, their hit rate sucks and they have to do heavy leverage trades to get themselves out of drawdown. I don't have no fucking stupid ass, you know, 50%, 60% strike rates. Fuck that shit. Okay. If I got to work within that, to me, that's gambling. That's gambling. If I can't know with a great deal of surety that I'm on the right side of the marketplace, number one, how do you get like that? You use a top down approach. Look at the weekly candle. Is it likely that the weekly candle is going to expand higher or lower? You're not trying to predict a close. Is it likely to expand higher or lower? Right away, that's 80% of your whole bias problem. A lot of you don't even look at the weekly chart. You're looking at the one and five minute chart because you see me trading there and you think I'm deriving everything from that time frame. I'm not. I'm starting all the way on the weekend tonight. I'm going to look at a weekly chart, not because I'm trading, but it's just because it's pattern. That's what I do. It's my routine. And I'm going to get a feel for what's it likely to be reaching for on the weekly chart. And that's my number one bias. I try to formulate every pattern with the most leverage and maximum risk management behind those trades in that direction. Right away, that removes the bullshit that most of you are going to blow your account on. If you trade like that, it's going to be very difficult for you to blow your account if you have discipline. You still can, <laughs> but it's more likely that you won't because you'll be trading mostly in the right direction. Oh, how do I know which one's going to – everything that you see me teaching in price action, you apply to a weekly chart. Is it in going towards a fair value gap above the market price? Is it going towards an old low below market price? It's either going to an efficiency, inefficiency rather above the market or below the market, or it's going to a high above the marketplace or below a low below the market price. That's it. That is it. You have, you have four conditions divided into two premise. It's going up to do one of two things. Go in and revisit an inefficiency, a fair value gap, or it's going above an old high for buy side liquidity. Two things to worry about, folks. That's it. It's only two conditions. That's it. Two conditions. If it's not likely to go up, it's going to go down. So what's it going to reach for? The nearest inefficiency, fair value gap, or the nearest short-term low. And the nearest short-term low or inefficiency, if it's being bearish, you determine where you are in the market price during the times of the day when you're going to be engaging in trading. Is there enough of a range to allow for you to profit? If there isn't, you just don't do anything. You sit still, wait for a new opportunity. How hard is that? For some of you, it's impossible because you don't have discipline. You're not willing to wait, and you have to wait for these things to come together. There has to be an agreement of multiple facets in time frames, logic, time of day, economic calendar. All those things have to come in, into the, the, the equation. Otherwise, the results you're going to get are random. Like it was for me. And when I got good positive results as a 20 year old, not even trading any of this shit, because I didn't know these things. I was just using stupid books. And I'm talking dumb books. And I didn't have a real good head start until I got Alexander Elder's Trading for a Living book. And the only thing good about that book is multiple time frames, three time frames, okay, not just making your trade decision on one, but the beginning of the book where it talks about how you have to. You know, deal with the mental things. And they talked a lot about alcoholism. Not that I've ever drank alcohol because I've never drank alcohol, but I was raised in an environment that had alcoholics in it and they were dysfunctional. And I had an uncle that introduced me to trading who was a functioning alcoholic. So all, all those things that he mentioned in the beginning of that book, which I think is absolutely essential reading. And again, I'll say the name of the book, Trading for a Living by Alexander Elder. Now, I have all his, his other books. Fuck them. They're not as good. The beginning of that book, before he even gets into technical stuff, 
The beginning of that book is the gem. Understanding things from a psychological standpoint. In my opinion, that part of that book is way better, way better than trading in the zone. Trading in the zone is sugar-coated bullshit. Okay, no disrespect to the man. It's a good book, but Alexander Elder's portion of the book where it's all talking about you know, the wrestling match that we have to deal with, and and it made sense to me because I watched how all those things impacted my family members who were drunks and how they couldn't succeed and how they blamed everything outside of themselves and that same shit happens in trading just because it's not alcohol doesn't mean you're not fucking drunk you can get drunk in these markets and not even being profitable but still drunk in the, the, the sense that you can't stop doing it and you keep doing it knowing it's hurting you and i did that in the beginning as a trader and when I read his book, it made so much sense to me because I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking up and I can't see I'm causing it myself. And I'm repeating these same things that are problematic. And even though I'm not a drinker and I've never drank, drank alcohol, I could see very easily how I would be a terrible person as a drunk or a drinker of alcohol. And this is why I've never done it. And well, that's not entirely why. My 16-year-old uncle passed away from a drunk driver hitting him. And he was drinking while riding it, and he's no more. So he was like a big brother to me. So that was a major thing in my life, why I never became an alcohol drinker and a cigarette smoker and a drug user. So I've never done any. I'm a straight error when it comes to that. But that book had a lasting impression on me as a developing trader. And I don't think I would be where I am today had I not read it because it gave me a perspective on how humans – interpret adversity, um, how we interact with adversity, and how we deflect the personal invitations that we place into our environment. And then when it comes home to roost and we have to deal with the consequences of that shit, we don't want to own it. It's somebody else's fault. And that you can't do that in trading. Like you, you cannot have that characteristic in trading. You own it. And if you suck as a trader, you have to admit that you suck. Either stop trading or Find someone that can teach you how to do the right things and then give yourself a lot more time than you think it's going to require. If you can't do that, just don't fucking touch these markets. And I honestly mean this. Don't even trade because if you can't wrestle yourself into submission over things like I'm talking about now, it won't matter how many times I sit with a live stream. I could literally push the button and you, tr you know, trade right behind me. And when I stop, you're going to fail. Because you haven't wrestled those demons that are, you know, they're beneath the surface. You know, you deal with them every day. They cause you to cause you to have anxious moments for no real reason or to be angry and bitter when you're really no reason to be jealous. All these things are character flaws. You have real issues going on inside of you. And if you have those things going on in your personal life. I'm telling you, the only thing that these markets are going to do is put a spotlight on those things, and they're going to amplify it. If you're a fucking drunk and you can't, can't, you can't handle yourself with alcohol, or if you do recreational drugs until you, you lose your mind and shit, these markets are going to cause you to do more of that shit, and it's going to be the callus that does your ass in. You, you won't – be able to look at, oh, I'm making money. It's going to keep me from doing those things. No, it's going to cause you to do more of those things because when you get in these markets, the wrestling match internally, you can't make that candle go up. On Friday, I was two and a half minutes late on when I thought that target was going to hit. I, I, I banned a guy on uh, on my YouTube channel and talking some shit. Oh, you, nobody can do that, dude. I do it a lot. I just happened to be two and a half minutes late on that one. But I'm usually within a three minute window, just like on Forex. I'm usually three to five pips away from the highest high and the lowest low. That's the that's the range of variance I'm allowing myself for precision. I'm usually exiting before that. Why? I want to be exiting, and I learned this from Larry Williams. I want to be exiting as it's sliding into where I think it's going to go. Because even if I am, you know, profitable in the trade i may not be able to get that last bit off because of spread because of it just simply not going where i thought it was going to go because it mentioned earlier forex every broker is going to have a different high and a different low and that's an inherent problem in that asset class and if you're demanding precision 
you're going to have to have a lot of compensation with highs and lows and targets. So the way I compensated for it was I would get out 15 pips, sometimes 20 pips before it would go to where I thought it was ultimately reaching, which was in many of your eyes, probably, you know, an over, you know, an over uh, kill for it. But, I, you know, I got to live with myself, right? So to be comfortable with what I was doing, that's how I did it. And I allowed the analysis to reward me and say, yeah, it got to where I thought it was going to go. And because it's my results and nobody needs to see what I'm doing, I don't have to say, oh, well, fuck you. You know, Even though I thought it was going to go to this level, it didn't go there. You're, I don't have to listen to the bullshit. Because even though if I do what I do and did on Friday, if I did it every single day of the week next year, I'd still have assholes and asshats in here trying to talk some shit because they're miserable pieces of shit. They, they suck. They hate their life. And they can't do this. So they outwardly manifest what they're feeling about themselves. And that's what this, that's what goes on in this industry. All the shit talkers, all these jealousy and these people that simply can't shut their fucking mouth or step up for real. Those types of people, they're plagued. They're plagued with real, real problems. And that's what's holding them back. Because if they weren't being held back, you would see all kinds of proof of them being able to do what like you saw me do yesterday. That's real precision. That's real algorithmic delivery. Okay, not retail shit. Okay, none of that stuff that's being used and tossed around as enigma. Nobody knows enigma. I've never taught it to anybody outside my family members, and they're never going to know it. Okay, I don't give a fuck. You can drag my ass in, in front of a court. CFTC will not pull it out of my ass either. I am not going to teach it. You want to see me demonstrate? I absolutely fucking can because it looks just like yesterday. Now, I am ready. I'm ready to teach you way beyond you thought you'd ever be able to become good at. But if your head isn't in the game the right way, if you're in here to try to debunk, do that before I start in February, because you can do it. You can go through some videos and then you'll come to a quick conclusion that yeah, you can't debunk it. So put that to bed, show up in February. On the 7th of February, I will, res I will resume mentoring. I will be live streaming on February 7th on YouTube and we'll all come together and we'll start outlining what our expectations should be. And I'll start teaching you over the chart in real time. And I promise you, you will learn over time. It won't be, oh, I watched that one live stream. Now I know it all. It does. No, you need to make sure that you understand that this takes time seeing things repeat. The things that I'm gonna talk about, they won't feel like they make that much of an impact. Like I didn't, I didn't learn anything because you're all looking for entry patterns and indicators to flash across your screen and you know shit moving around on your chart that hides price action. Fuck all that. That's nonsense. Okay. The algorithm is not looking at triangles and patterns and you know emojis swinging around on a chart. Okay. That's all nonsense. That's attracting like a like a carnival. You remember going as a kid walking through a carnival and you got the carnival barkers. Hey, hey, come on over here. One dollar gets three chance. Let's go. You can do it. Get the pretty girl up here. She can do it better than you, guy. Come on. Jealousy causes the guy to say, you want the asshole? I'm going to go over there. I'm going to win. And then he's spending his money, losing, and his girlfriend's embarrassed. <laughs> and the carnival barkers made money and put the coin in his pocket. You can't fall victim to shit like that. You can't be... In, induced into doing dumb shit because a chart looks flashy or it looks more technical because it has more lines and indicators and shit all over it like these heat map trader guys there's a guy i'm watching on uh on, on live stream now i don't know what the fuck this guy's got going on in this chart it looks ridiculous it's like a bubble magnifies on the chart what do you what, what the fuck is that supposed to do for you to do just tell me what time frame you're in Okay, I'm going to tell you the liquidity or the inefficiency is going to run to. Okay, and then we're going to stick with just that. I don't need a trend line. I don't need no indicators. All I got to do is look for those types of things. It's four. It's four things to determine. First is is it going up or down? How do you know that? Where did it just trade from? Did it, did it take liquidity or has it reacted from an imbalance? And how's that fit inside of the weekly expansion? Because you got to go right back to that root of the weekly chart because that's where the algorithm is. Oh shit. And you see these guys out there at the live streaming. Yep, um, I'm going long here. I've got this little thing swinging around telling me I should be a buyer. Yep, I'm going to go short now. Oh, and oh shit, I got, I got stopped out. Mark just doesn't like me today. No, you don't know how to fucking trade. 
Okay, you're trading against institu real institutional order flow and real algorithmic price delivery. And you're drawing down in front of everybody. If you just would have simply held on to the trade that was going long and let it rip. If you really knew what the hell was going on, you would have done well. You would have done fifteen, twelve thousand dollars on a Friday too in a PM session. But you didn't. You didn't. Because the logic is unknown to everyone else. The people that dig into my course and all of my lessons and then listen to these long-winded shit here. Okay, there's there's three people that come into this this Twitter space here. One, people hear me. As soon as I say something that sounds arrogant, oh, fuck this guy. Goodbye, see you later. I don't want you here anyway because you, you can't be taught. It's confidence, not arrogance. It's authorship, not pride. Then you have the other crowd that is ready to listen. They can see and hear that I went through this shit. I hurt myself doing this, and they don't want to repeat that same shit. They're smart enough to know this guy's going to tell me how I can avoid majority of the pain. I want to learn that and still get me to the end result he's aiming for as a teacher. And then you have the other person that comes in here and says, this is bullshit. Everything about this is bullshit, despite the proof and everything that's being shown. So I know, I know that that's always going to be the case. It's always been the case when I was on America Online too. But because of social media and the ease of people feeling like they can say anything they want in the safety of their cell phone and four inch universe, knowing that they're so far away from the person they're talking shit about, they would never do that in front of them. And the anonymity hides them. And they're living mundane little lives that don't do shit. They are nobodies. And because they're miserable, they're going to say things to you when you step out there. If you have a YouTube channel or if you do a service and they're going to claim that you are a scammer or a fraud, despite being able to do what nobody else can do. Because they feel like they have to do it because they can't stomach it. They can't do it. And you have to sit back and let them roast in it. Stew in that because you can't fix them despite ever trying to you can't i tried it you can't reach you can't reach these people they think that they're gonna take you down they're gonna hurt you they're not gonna do shit they're gonna still be right where they're at and you're gonna elevate more and more and more and more and they're not gonna hold you back your friends aren't gonna hold you back unless you let them your job isn't gonna hold you back unless you let it your job isn't gonna be the reason why you can't be successful. It's going to be the reason why you're fucking going to be successful because right now where you're at, that money, that's it. How much do you anticipate getting a raise next year? Think about it. How much of an increase in pay are you expecting to get from your boss or your company? How about this? Are you sure you're going to be still employed next year? If the economic downturn increases into next year, it might. If it does, how would that impact you and your household? You got to get right. You got to get ready. You got to make your house ready. You got to find a way to get income. Learn how to do this skill. Trade. Get funded if that's what you want to do if you don't have the funds to do it. Multiple streams of income. YouTube. Showing your prowess. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think it's bragging. I don't think it's showing off. I think it's you doing you. And if people have a problem with it and they, they're jealous, fuck them. Fuck them, because if they could do it, they would do it too, and they wouldn't give a fuck that, you, that other people can do it. I don't care that other people are doing it. There's lots of other YouTube. Listen, I've already said it in this video. I oh, well, not this video, <laughs> but this space and other spaces. I got every bit of respect for even the assholes that don't like me. That if they get out there and they live stream, fumble around in, in my you know the market replay and and fake demo accounts and calling it live accounts. Do it if you're pushing a button in front of other people. Go right ahead. You're in uh, funded accounts. And you're out there and you're pushing a button. You think it's going to happen. That, that, look, man, all the respect to you. Great. That's just not my cup of tea. I don't need to do that. I've never had to do it. and I ain't going to do it. But I'm going to be out there next year. And I'm going to be outlining where I think the market's going to go. And I guarantee you, every one of these live streamers are going to be listening to my shit. They may not like it. And when if I get it wrong, you're going to hear that they watched it. <laughs> but you won't hear it when the 90% club is... This is what happened, and this is what it panned out. And see, that was the main takeaway for this year. I want you to know this in closing because we're closing this, this space. I know it's been a long one, but 
It's the last one, right? So when we spend time together next year and we go through the process of looking at what the markets are doing and how it's likely to draw towards one pool of liquidity or in an efficiency above or below the marketplace. Over the course of the week, you need to be able to take stock on what it is that transpired. How many times was it right versus how many times it was wrong? By doing that, what that's going to help answer for a lot of you is that scared feeling of, oh, what if my trade is wrong? Or what if I do it wrong? If you're afraid to do it wrong, and that's an impediment for you beginning, then I can see how that would be paralyzing. But we're going into this with no buttons being pushed the whole year. You're telling me I shouldn't trade? I'm telling you, if you don't know what the fuck you're doing, you shouldn't be in there doing that. No, you shouldn't be in there trying to get funded accounts. You should be learning how to read price. I promise if you do that for this coming year, you will have no difficulty getting a funded account. And then once you get that funded account, you're going to know based on what I teach you next year how to manage that funded account so you don't lose it. And you can take from it and harvest income. And you need to do it soon because I believe that those funded accounts aren't going to be so accessible soon. It's just a gut hunch. I might be completely wrong. But while it's available, you need to be taking advantage of it. But don't think it's going to be closing out next month. A couple of years, it might not be there. And it'd be best if you could just harvest what you could from it while you can. Get your scratch raised up, your money, your bankroll, the way you can. And get your side hustles on YouTube, you know, account service, not account service, what am I saying? Uh, like analysis communities where, you know, I, I have no problem, no problem someone coming under my wing learning from me and then going out there and monetizing their skill set. I'm not gonna look at that, oh, you asshole, you copied off of me. I trained you, that was the whole intent. I'm telling you to go out there and make fucking money. That's the reason why I did this. I didn't make this so I can be uh, you know, followed the most on YouTube and that's it. I want people fucking making money. I want to know when I lay my head down, I can think back and say, you know what? I've impacted people's lives for the better. And now nobody can find fault in me. I'm not charging you. I'm not taking anything from you, but I'm, I'm, I'm promising you, you are absolutely going to see shit on a different perspective next year. You're going to see it. You're going to understand it. You may not be able to execute like you see me doing because that's unrealistic, right? But finding one good setup and knowing that that's enough and stopping until you grow in your own personal ability, that's the proper way of learning. That's a real mentorship right there. That's it. That's being taken under the wing by someone that knows how to do it. You don't have any animosity because you're not being asked to pay for something you can barely afford. And then you're worrying about, is it really worth the amount of money I paid? No, no amount of money, no amount of money could be paid to me to justify what I'm willing to do next year. You couldn't pay me. It's because I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to help you. I want to see you succeed. And I want to have a small part in that. Not because I want you to worship me. Once you get there, hey, man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's enough. You don't have to have a memorial to me on your fucking YouTube, okay? You don't need to have a, a license tag, you know, ICT got me here. Fuck all that. <laughs> that's worship. I don't want that. Just acknowledge, give me thanks, and that's it. That's all. That's all I ask for. Isn't it that reasonable? That's reasonable, isn't it? I'm not going to ask you to do something beyond just working towards it the effort. And I want to share that moment with you, a small moment of it. It's all yours. It's all your credit. But I just want to have that moment where I can look at you and say, I told you, if you just gave yourself the chance, look where you're at now. Look what you were able to accomplish. Look at where you're at right now and what you can do. That feeling of accomplishment, that you grinded through all the bullshit, all the horse shit, everybody doubting you, your fucking friends, your fucking spouse, your fucking anybody, that, anybody online ever said anything about you. You know what it feels like. They said something to you. You got a, you got a chip on your shoulder. That shit falls off and smooths out real quick when you start making $30,000 a month. Real fucking smooth. 
You ain't got no problems then. I want to see and hear your testimonies. I don't want to see it in the text. I want to see people's faces this time next year. I want to see them say, this totally transformed everything. And this is what I'm going to do with it. I have had so many personal testimonials sent to me like that with video. And my wife and I, my kids, I, I'm, I'm moved. Because I know what it was like for me. It was very, very hard. And I didn't have any of this support structure you guys have. And this is my entire life. I pour everything into my students. Because I want them to succeed. I don't want them to have any of the hardships. But some of you fight me. And you arm wrestle me. And you want to do it your own way. And I know it's not the right way. And you don't know that it's not the right way. Everything in your life is about to change. You don't understand how much yet. And I'm trying to do the best I can to make it a little bit easier. And for some of you, you're going to take this skill and do amazing shit with it. You're going to live a totally different lifestyle. And I don't want you to be selfish with it. When you see somebody in need, help them. Not when they ask you for it either. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm going to help them by teaching them. And that's not what the fuck I said. Help them. They need something. Provide it. Do it anonymously. You see somebody in the grocery store? They're pushing a cart around. You can read their face. You can see it. They're broke. They're Come behind them and pay them. Tell the cashier, I got them. I do that every time I go to the grocery store. When I first got with my wife, she was like, what are you doing that for? She didn't understand it. I said, never tell me that again. Don't ever speak to me about it. Don't ever ask me to justify why I'm doing it. You want to touch somebody's heart, you do that. And when they turn to you and they say, you just let me have enough money for the rest of the week, the rest of the month. I don't have my rent money, but I can feed my kids now because of that. It costs you nothing, man, to do stuff like that. It costs you nothing. And think about how many times you know you were standing right next to somebody that could have used a hand like that and you didn't do a fucking thing because it felt uncomfortable. When you live your life like this and you want to do it for people. And I've had people say, no, I don't want you to do that. Some of me actually cussed me out. I didn't ask you for a handout. It's going to happen sometimes. But you want to leave a, an impression, a good one. And when you start doing things like that for other people, it's contagious. And you want to do it more. And it changes you. Because as a 20-year-old, I was a real arrogant prick, and I was self-centered, and it was all about me. I never would have helped anybody else in the store. I never would have gave them anything. I never would have bought them a car. I never would have gave them a house. I never would have done any of those things. I never would have paid for their children to get through school. I never would have gave their kids clothes, school supplies, the entire time they had their whole schooling. I never would have done those things. I was all about me. I had to make me feel good. And the more I did for me, the shittier I felt about everything I was doing. I felt like a vacuum. I couldn't fill it. Everything I tried to do that was all about me, looking good, driving this, living like this, spending that. The more I poured into it, the more empty I was. The more money I made, the less I felt I had any, I didn't have any substance, none. So you have to have a, a plan direction what you're going to do when you have this money coming in. 
What are you planning to do with it? I see a lot of people. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be this and this. It all changes when it's all about them. Because when I was 20, I was the same way. And don't, don't think that that won't help you be a better person when you start doing because it will. And then when you start trading larger, you start thinking to yourself, you know what? I'm not taking this trade to do something you know, for me financially, which drives people into dumb decisions like it did with me when I was 20. I can remember the day I was dating my, I know, I know we were supposed to close this face, but I got some shit to get off my chest. <laughs> so in June, 1995, I was, uh, was dating my oldest son's mother. And uh, I had already found out that she was a married woman. She was pregnant, uh, due to give birth in October. And she threatened that she was going to raise the kid, which I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl yet, um, with her husband at the time. And then he would call me out and threaten me, saying that he was going to let the child hurt itself and he wasn't going to do anything about it. And uh, you can only take so much of that kind of shit before you start doing things that you normally wouldn't do. And to make this woman feel like she had a chance with me so that way I could see him born and my name on the birth certificate, which would make custody issues a lot easier for me. I asked her, I said, what would you like to do? Because she didn't want, she didn't believe that I wanted to be with her, which I didn't. So she goes, let's go to Hawaii. Because you got all this money, let's go to Hawaii. I said, okay. So I said, try to find a flight in a hotel and we'll go. And I meant it. So she says, um, there's nothing until next week. I said, well, we can wait till next week. No, and let's go. I want to go this weekend. I said, well, we'll name something else. So let's go to Bermuda. All right, find something in Bermuda. So she found it was called Senesta Beach Hotel. It was the largest hotel on the south tip of Bermuda and gorgeous. It's not there anymore. Hurricanes tore it off, but you can Google it and see it was there. But uh, it had three five-star restaurants in it and just, a, just amazing. But um, we flew out there and the whole time I was there, the majority of the time that we were on that island, I was in the room. We went out to eat. I didn't want to be with her in public. I didn't want to do anything with her. We took one scooter ride. I felt my son kicking me in the back. <laughs> but uh, apart from that, it was miserable. And what was I doing? I was spending money on something that was not wholesome. It was just to, to let her believe that I wanted to be with her and her husband. You know, I back then we had pagers. We didn't we didn't have like the, um, the the ease of everything we have right now. Like I'm talking to you in this cell phone, and you're listening to me everywhere everywhere in the world. Uh, that whole business of communication wasn't available to us yet, so we did everything through pagers, and we would send messages through the numbers. So because he was always constantly sending me voicemails in the evening time saying, you know what he was going to do and how he's going to take me to the bank and he was going to do this and do that, which I understand he's mad. You know, I didn't know his wife was married to him. I, I didn't think she was married, but I ended up getting her pregnant and I was stuck. I had to figure out the best way to manage it. And I didn't have anybody that could tell me the best advice, obviously, because who, who gets in those types of environments, right? And I was young, I was stupid and with money and no real guidance of any kind. And here we are, we're in Bermuda. And I had to just let this motherfucker know. I said, we're in Bermuda, motherfucker. And I typed it out in the code of, you know, the, you know when you look at a, um, an old push button phone, one is uh, ABC, two, so on. It's three letters each button or whatever. 
and you would have to sit down and write the numbers out and then figure out that's how we did the shit <laughs> you young you young folks are like what the hell if it, you older folks know exactly what i'm talking about you're laughing like, yeah we used to do that shit but i wanted him to know that i did that you know i flew his wife to bermuda and she lied and said she was doing something with her girlfriends on a pool league in vegas and I wanted him to know that you know you're a piece of shit for doing what you're doing. I'm an asshole for sleeping with your wife, but I didn't know I was sleeping with your wife. I thought I was sleeping with a single woman that didn't have a kid. And obviously, when she got pregnant, she laid that on me. It's my responsibility. It's mine. You know, it is what it is. But when you have money and you do things like that, or if you get caught up in situations like that, and young men listen to me. You think having lots of money, you're going to run around and be promiscuous. A lot of women, different women all the time. You know, everybody's in this Andrew Tate shit. What a piece of shit that guy is. Okay. I don't want to hear anything about that fucking guy. He's not a top G. He's a piece of shit. Okay. <laughs> it is what it is. His views on women, stupid. And bottom line is this if you think that that's what looks sexy or handsome or, or put together for a woman, nobody's thinking that guy's put together. He's a clown. He's an entertainment piece, and that's it, okay? Made lots of money doing stupid shit, and, you know, whatever. That's one thing. He's young, and I guarantee if he lives long enough, he'll come out and say, I did dumb shit. I should have done. We all do, but when you're young, like I was young, I wanted to live a certain life. I wanted the Ric Flair lifestyle. You know, I grew up listening and watching this guy carrying on, and long and short of it is, is, you know, when I got the money, you know, I started doing that shit, renting limousines, going to, you know, really fancy restaurants, taking all my friends out there and just trying to live it up because I wanted that public appreciation that, hey, look at that person right there. Because remember, I grew up modest. $350 a week was a lot of money. That was my grandfather's earnings at Essex Lumber Yard. And we lived in what was called Cardboard City. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was Villa Gardens, okay? And that is white trash as you can get. That's where we come up from, Middle River. And when you get a taste of having money and you heard other people in other neighborhoods and other areas in the, the state and local area where you've grown up and other schools that are better and their kids and shit, and you're fucking their asses up in fights, but they're beating you in all the opportunities in life because they are in a better position because they can afford to go to better schools. They have a family that has both the father and the mother, and they're, they have advantages that you don't have. I had all that stuff growing up. And when I had a taste of real money, I wanted the exact revenge on everybody. Like it was like a fucking movie, you know, dialogue in my head all the time. Like I wanted to show the world, you know, <laughs> I'll be back, you know, terminate your bullshit, you know. And the more I did that kind of stuff, and my friends would be like, man, this is awesome. What they're saying is, it's awesome. I ain't got to pay for it, and you're paying for it. That's what they're saying. And that's exactly what your friends are going to say to you. But you're going to interpret that as, you're awesome. You're going to hear that. Your subconscious is going to hear, you're awesome. No, you're a sucker. Just like I was being a sucker. Okay? I got wrapped up into a married woman issue because my friends told her, I had money. She saw I had money, but she didn't know to what degree. And I didn't know she knew that. So when she invites me into a situation where I thought we were going to be friendly, <laughs> we got friendly, but it cost me a lot. It cost me 21 years. So I had to live a life a different way, hide things from her. And no, I wasn't a deadbeat dad. I had joint custody. But I beat her in child support. The courts came to the conclusion that, you know, I only had to pay $14 a month towards health insurance. And they said, because it's only $14, they just waived it. And I carried health insurance on him. So uh, winning is a thing for me. Okay. I, I try to make sure that I stay ahead of everything as much as I can. And I had to learn that from hardships, doing dumb shit. School of Hard Knocks, getting into situations that money put me into and not knowing how to handle myself. 
So if you're thinking you're going to take this stuff and run around and be an Andrew Tate type fucking clown, you're, look what just happened to him. Look, just look what happened to him. Okay. If you try to be the hardest nail, somebody's going to act like the fucking hammer and nail your ass. Okay. And it ain't going to be somebody from fucking Texas. It's going to be somebody from, you know, some authority, some figure that's going to come down and squeeze your ass. Okay. And let you know that you're, you're insignificant and you can be touched. But your friends and your family are going to paint a picture for you that isn't going to be what you're expecting on, on either spectrum. You're, they're either going to be jealous of you, like my family was. They literally were so jealous, and then they wanted things given to them for free. My aunt and uncle, who I pay room and board to, uh, my uncle not so much, but my aunt really took advantage of you know, what I was earning under her roof. But if she would have said, pay me more per week, I would have done that. Not, can you pay for a new pool liner? Can you pay for a new roof on our house? Can you pay for new furniture? Can you pay for our vacation to Florida when we can't afford to do it? And we want to go with your aunt that does have money and we don't want to be embarrassed by that. And we don't have money to pay for this, that, and the other thing. And all those guilt trips that you don't realize that you're experiencing, that your friends and family will put on you, those things crop up like easy when you have money. You might not see it, or you might see it, and it may be turning off and say, you know what, I ain't got to deal with none of you, which is eventually what happened. And I spent 10 years away from most of my family. My own children, not what I'm referring to there, but I'm talking about cousins and aunts and uncles and things. I distanced myself from all of them because, you know, they didn't like, I was able to find success and they worked their whole life and owe still money on their homes that they had to remortgage and, and refinance and get equity out and live their lifestyle and owe three times what their house cost back in the eighties. And you can't sell it for what they got wrapped up in dent. So they're miserable people and they are the product of what Alexander Elder talks about in his first portion of his book, Trading for a Living. The children of alcoholics are absolutely victimized and they grow up with mindsets that are so warped, even if they never touch a drop of alcohol, they're still fucked up. And my aunts and my uncle and my mother are a living testimony to that shit and they never really amounted to anything but they're miserable like i couldn't be around them in the holidays because all they talk about is everybody else and how so-and-so's this and so-and-so's that and i'm listening to them i'm like you got nothing you're all broke you're miserable you're in debt up to your eyeballs and you got the audacity to talk about other people and that uh, that's why i said i can't be around you in the holidays it's just it's a drain i feel like vampires suck the life out of me and for 10 years, my whole existence around the holidays has been much better experience. Keeping toxic people out of your life. And in the beginning, when you start finding success, you're going to wrestle with that. Once you realize that they're toxic and if you can't talk them into understanding they're being toxic, and it's not going to be probably successful if you tried to do it anyway, the sooner you get away from that shit, the better. Because it will mess with you. You'll feel guilty about not being around them, like you're like you're being arrogant or you're being a jerk, you're being pompous. You're not. You're living your fucking life. And there ain't no shame in that. What says you have to be around toxic people? Who says that you have to be around people that is constantly drama-ridden? Eat up with drama. If that's what your life is right now, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to make more of it because you have money. That's what's going to happen. You want to see somebody that is successful, that has their shit together, how much drama they got going on around them? How much are they providing in terms of drama? How much are they producing of that drama? That's how you tell whether somebody is successful or not. Because if they can find themselves in a position where they can just remove themselves from drama and not give a fuck what anybody says, who cares? Whether it be friends or family, who cares? That's successful because they know that they can't change that. 
you're not going to be able to change, especially if you're a young person. You're not equipped to. You don't have the the worldly experience that, unfortunately, like everybody else tells you right now, and I was, I was told the same thing, you'll understand when you get older. Well, at 50, I, hold, I know a whole lot more than I did when I was 20. And the ass-backwards way of thinking about money and relationships and people are totally different now. It's diametrically opposed to what I felt and experienced as a young man. And coming up and making lots of money, that experience is, well, if you're not equipped mentally to handle it, you'll, you'll self-destruct. And while I wasn't a drinker and I didn't use drugs, my vice was pride and arrogance. Do you think I'm arrogant now? I'm not. I was absolutely disgusting. Not like the Andrew Tate where it's oozing disgusting, okay? But it was close to it. And because I had a chip on my shoulder, because my first wife leaving me for um, an older man, and she was young, wasn't even 18 yet. And the whole neighborhood knew about it. So the whole neighborhood shut his business down. Ran up a bill and a tab for groceries and never paid it. And that was their way of getting back at what he did to me and my family. I didn't ask any of them to do that. Think about that. That's instant karma. And she's living a life with some guy, you know, honestly, 20 minutes from where I live right now. And she's in no better position than she was when she left. And I'm living a totally different life. And I have been often wondering, you know, what she would think if she knew. <laughs> and you're going to do that, young men. You're going to end young women for the ones that uh, find success in this. And, and maybe some men have uh, cast you to the side because, you know, they didn't want to do with any, do anything with you anymore. They found something better in their eyes and chased something else. And as a man, you know, there, there comes a time when the term chasing tail or chasing someone for another knock on your bedpost, that's no longer a pursuit. You want to have a meaningful relationship. You want to be able to sit down and have a conversation with your best friend who you're also intimate with and that you raise children with and you can confide in and you can trust your finances with. That's a life partner. That's someone that your whole life revolves around. And you want to do everything to make them happy. I am at that point where my wife is asking that of me. She's been very patient with me and allowed me to divulge a lot of my insights and experience and, and time with all of you. And I think that's reasonable. And I know it's going to be met with some people saying, you know, you're a jerk because you don't do this anymore and blah, blah, blah. Just know that I know that some of you are going to say those types of things. And I know that you probably don't really mean it in the way it's going to come out, but I don't give a fuck. <laughs> okay. I, I have a wife that I want to maintain happiness with. I have a family. I'm a 50 year old man that can still boot scoot and boogie. No, I'm not a country fan. But I want to be able to do that while I have time and things might be getting harder as I've been talking about. And I want to try to jump on that opportunity while I can. But I also want to go out with a clear conscience, knowing that I did everything I could except for trade your account for you. So if that isn't enough after next year. I'm going to apologize and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't live up to your false expectations and unrealistic expectations because none of that shit was promised to any of you anyway. But I know the result will be testimonials like I've already received from all around the world anyway. And I think that even if I just got one, the, a young man from Germany just sent me uh, a card and a uh, little keychain those are uh, shamrock and uh how it stayed in the envelope i don't know because the, literally the the envelope was split on the right side and all i had to do was pick the envelope up and turn it to its side and then the keychain came out of it i'm like how the hell did this come all the way from germany and not fall out so he sends me this link to a youtube channel where he leaves me a message and my wife and i were watching it and he was struggling to try to wish us a merry christmas and a happy new year and show his appreciation for what he's learning and such 
And it was emotional to watch that because he didn't have to do that. Like he didn't have to do those things at all. And it didn't cost much, I'm sure, in terms of money. But the, the aspect of him taking the time out to say, hey, look, I appreciate what you've done and thank you. And uh, he let me see his face. He let me hear his own tongue and his own, you know, his own voice say that. I've had so many of those things and they're touching, they're moving to me. And I have a face to put to. I have a lot of screen names. I have a lot of student IDs and all these people with names. I don't know how to associate anything with them. Some of you, I know you by your profile picture that ain't even you. It's something, not even a human. It's some kind of icon. But the majority of you, I don't know your voice. I don't know what your face looks like, but I have a lot of them that have shared that with me. And I want that so much because that, and I haven't shared them then. Like I haven't never put them out there publicly. I would never do that. They're for me. They're for me and my family. And when my wife sees these, number one, she gets to see how it impacts me. And she, I watched her moved by it because it makes it more palatable for her. She understands now when she sees it's not just a video going up on YouTube about a video game. It's like in her eyes, it's like these folks that make these video game YouTube channels are playing video games and they're talking shit at once, you know, uh, you know talking smack. Hey, I'm playing you. I'm beating you. That, you know, that's her. That's what she's always viewed it as. Like she, like it's a video game and I'm just talking to other people I'm competing against. Not realizing that I'm pouring myself out into all of your lives and your understanding. So that way you can be better. And when she hears it and she sees it, I'm thankful for that. Because clearly my talking about it wasn't enough articulation for her to really get what it is that drives me. All of you, every single one of you, I felt just like you feel or felt when you first started. And it was scary. It was stressful. I felt like I was never going to get it. I felt like I was never going to figure this stuff out. And it just feels good to be in a position where I know that I know and I can share it with you. I'm so thankful that the Lord has given me time to do it, energy to do it, the resources to do it, and the desire. Because as a young man, I never would have done this. I wouldn't have cared. I liked being the only one that could do it. I got off on that. And that's how you tell maturity. And it, it, it slowly happened by looking at people struggling on baby pips and seeing their shit that they tried this and losing money and they, they're getting frustrated. And I'm sitting back here quietly, unbeknownst to all of you. I have all the answers. And I felt guilty. And I'm like, man. I don't want to be the center of attention as much as some of you people think I do. I don't. And I had to find a way where I could be influential, be under the radar, and still make an impact. So the approach I use is what you've seen. And I'm just. I'm impressed that it caught fire like it did. No advertising, you know, all only people dabbling in it, seeing it work for themselves and then spreading the word saying, this is what I'm doing. And it's, it's neat. It's really neat to see it because it's not about me. It has nothing to do with me. It's the whole experience of it all. And all of you have unique 
experiences. And when I get to see you explain what it's done for you, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And I love it. Like I absolutely love having a face associated with a student that put the time and effort in and, and listening to them weep and sharing that with me. You can't put a price tag on that. It stays with you. I'm just very thankful that I've been given an opportunity to be someone like this. And I hope that I'm helpful to all of you in the coming year. And I hope that you learn more from me and you become a better person, not just as a trader, but you're inspired to do more for other people. I think if you measure everything in that, you're going to find a much more purpose-driven life, and not about money and things. And you're certainly going to be much more interesting to other people. I learned that the hard way. I thought the bigger wallet, the bigger toys and things would garner that only for so much. And then when they get around you, they find out who you are and you're an ugly person inside. It doesn't matter how much money you have then. Nobody really wants to entertain you. And they finally get to the point where, eh, you might pay for dinner and you might pay for all the fun stuff, but I have other plans tonight. That's what would happen to you. And that's exactly what happened to me as a young man. So, anyway, I think that's going to be enough for this one. I wanted to have an opportunity to, to thank you all for spending your time with me this year, helping me grow our community. I'm very appreciative of that. I think our community is a, a unique one. For the most part, we all encourage one another, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you all appreciate the fact that this doesn't really have a place of deserving or that you're entitled to receive it, and you all understand that it's a gift. And I'm thankful that, for the most part, you've all been respectful of me, and I'm thankful for that. My wife is thankful. I'm hoping that you all appreciate what I'm willing to do next year. And it's my prayer in Jesus' name that I'm able to reach more of you. I'm just excited to see where you all go with it. So later tonight, when you're ringing in the new year, just know I'm going to be smiling and thinking about all of you. I don't know all of your faces. I don't know all of your names. But all of you are in my thoughts. You're in my prayers. And you are all my goal in 2023. Have a happy and safe new year tonight. And I will speak to you again probably on Tuesday. <laughs> Until then, be safe.